call this meeting to order. This is a this is a budget hearing for the FY 2015 budget. Um, we is the part of the budget process is the council review. This is an opportunity for the councilors to ask questions that um, or make comments um, to various department heads who will come present before us um, and describe and explain in depth their budget. As I said, it should you have any questions. There will be another meeting tomorrow in this room. We're in the uh, City Hall hearing room. Agenda. The, um, um, that will lead us up into the council meeting where there is a public hearing. The public will be invited to come and speak and discuss and ask questions about the budgets uh, or make their comments as well. Um, and that will be in the regular council session at 7.05. So, um, I'm gonna ask as we start that um, secretary take the role just to, for attendance. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. On her way. Councilor Carney is on her way. Councilor Spector. Uh, he's excused, I think, with, away with an excuse. Councilor O'Donnell? Here. Councilor Shara? Here. Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Labarge? Present. Councilor Klein? Um, excused. Councilor Boyd? Here. Okay. So, first up, um, Chief Sinkowitz is here from the Northampton Police Department. Uh, this is on on your budget book, it's on page 51. And uh, Chief, you have the floor. Okay, uh, you have in the book the uh, one-page summary uh, with all the detail about the finances for the past years and this year, so I won't go into that a great deal. Uh, but I did, I had originally done a much more expansive narrative that really highlights a lot of the successes we've had since uh, during the, the fiscal year 2014 handed it out at the Public Safety Committee in April, so I brought some for you all here today. And it's pretty expansive. You see a lot of the great work that other people do. Did you give them the public chair? Oh, it's this OC presentation. Yep, yes, thank you. So uh, it's a good opportunity for us to kind of showcase uh, in a more uh, in-depth manner than uh, kind of distill it all down um, and on one page. Uh, and my comment sheet, the one page, I do refer to the fact that uh, we are on track to live well within our budget again this fiscal year. So uh, I think it's my 20th budget that I've been able to successfully do that. Uh, something I'm very proud of. Uh, but you also have two internal uh, financial transfers on your agenda tomorrow. Um, I wonder if it would be appropriate just to chat about it now if you have any questions and send me a trip to City Council. We, we can do that as well. So okay. Yeah. Well, there's one for a $29,527 transfer. It's an insurance check for a, a, a patrol SUV that uh, was involved in a rollover accident in March of this year at 143 AM uh, up on Audubon Road. Um, it's an outstanding deal that the insurance company is giving us, and you already approved a previous $10,000 transfer from personal services to OM, which combined will give us uh, be able to replace the car, soup to nuts, all the equipment, et cetera, in it. So we'll get a brand new car um, for basically $10,000. And I'm gonna hope that you would consider two readings. I sent a memo to the council uh, president about it because they are, uh, our dealer, uh, IMP, just by a handshake is holding on to their last 2013 leftover for us that's all ready to go. And if I can get the vote tomorrow, I can execute the contract and they won't release it and I'll save $2,000 over the next year's model. Actually on that, on that item, on the request, and uh, it's in your agenda. Should be in your agenda, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in your packet. So, any questions relative to to that? To the this is related to a rollover that occurred a couple of months ago yep. uh, on Audubon Road. The dark and stormy night. Dark and stormy night. This is one of the brand new. Nobody got injured. The officer climbed out. He was fine. It was brand new. This is a, a first round of two year olds. I'm sorry, two thousand thirteen. The road was just foggy. He just claims he nodded off. His wheel caught the gully and it just pulled him over. So, 
since I reviewed it. Training, but the entire the entire night. Uh, no, so there are no questions relevant to those two items. Okay, then we'll discuss. And we'll be able to discuss that more in finance tomorrow in the council meeting. So. And the other one was just again the FY14. And I'll get that. It was uh, fifty thousand one hundred and seventy dollars, which is a, from PS to OM police equipment. And this is an officer initiated uh, idea. They want to uh, reestablish the uh, color guard, the honor guard. Um, we have a dress A blouse uniform that they want to dress up a little bit. Uh, I said there's not a lot of money to do this, we're not replacing everything, so they went and got everybody's old coats and cleaned them up, and basically this amounts to some tailoring and some other things. Um, everybody's excited about it, it's a great morale builder, and uh, they're all looking forward to it. And I do have ample money in PS for this, this 15,000 transfer will take care of everything, about everybody's dress jacket, so the guys, the guys and girls would truly appreciate it, they're really excited about it. Um, counselors, who you might recall, there used to be a uh, pretty common parade representation in the police department and, and uh, with the color guard. Really? Well, I mean, my only complaint was they made us look kind of like mooks <laughs> in comparison. They just kind of showed us up a little bit. But yeah. well, you're you're going to see some other things. We've had a lot of ideas over the past several months about changing the uniforms. There are no cost things. Uh, all things for comfort and looks, and everybody's looking forward to it. This is kind of the culmination of what this appointment does have some cost to it. So I appreciate your consideration and two votes so we can get the tailors in there and get the work done. It'll be a voice of the there again. Councilors, do you have any questions of the chief about the police department budget, uh, budget as presented in the budget book in the narrative? Okay. Do you want to talk about 15 a little bit? Might as well. Yeah, looks like I'll just give you the highlights. I don't see any questions, so. Okay. So far. I figured I'd say it and get the questions. Um, okay. I mean, basically, what's written in here is the same thing I'm briefly going to talk about. I mean, it's really a pleasure uh, out of all the years I've been doing this, the 20 years as chief, not to have to do less with more, or have a level of services, a level of funded budget. Um, the great work that the man the finance director has done, and the citizens voting for the override um, that helps maintain all the personnel that I'm budgeted for. Uh, we're working through that. And it's nice just to sit down and do a budget with some thought about things that you might want to improve on and add to. So I thank the mayor for so much for that and, and the voters. I mean, overall, the total budget is just under a 2% increase. Some of that is in OM, a total of 45,000. Um, I've jumped up the amount of training because we have a very young department, a lot of new supervisors that require uh, more specialized training, which is Recruit Academy. Uh, so there's a bump in that area. I approximated about a 5% fuel increase cost for the year. I've been pretty good on that year to year. Um, again, we're getting much more heavy into more complicated forensic investigations that increase their budget uh, by a few thousand dollars because we are uh, doing much more and it's required because of what is required by court. As you know, juries like the, uh, juries like the, uh, you know, Proof beyond a reasonable doubt of DNA confirmation of every crime. We don't do that, but they certainly need some uh, more supplies. And also in this fiscal year, used to uh, go to transfer from, I forget what the account is, but for the kill, uh, care and kill costs. We've now rolled that over into the animal control line item. So I built the fee increase and covered that. So it comes right out of my budget now. OOM was increased by 11,000. That's a reflection of uh, the free cruisers we get in parking and reserves. Uh, that's reflecting on what the anticipated uh, increase in cost would be for the street cars. And then we had two extra paydays that we had to calculate it, which is $18,672 uh, for FY15. <coughs> so again, it's just shy of a 2%. We have one outstanding contract um, that's pending. And our revenues down a little bit to about 185000 for all the fees and permits and citations and such that we've been like here. That's it in a nutshell. Councilor Adams and Councilor Murphy. What is it you mean that you have to come during two extra days of payroll? I see it on your but I don't know what that means. It's by vert. You, you can have to, you. We have to speak. Oh, it's okay. I said. I, and, and let me just make a general statement. It, it'd help if everyone speak loud enough so that this camera can pick it up. 
Uh, okay. So the, the, and I'll tell you if it's academic next week. There you go. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Chief said that they had to factor in two extra days of payroll, which is in the budget booklet. I don't understand what that meant. Just by virtue of the schedule, the calendar year, uh, some years were two days short, some years were two or three days more. This is a year that were two days higher. There's really 367 paydays in the fiscal year for FY15. So we have to calculate in those two extra paydays. Is that a correct way of describing it? Right. A, a normal year has 26 pay periods, but there may be a couple of days to get you to the end of June that have to get booked for the previous year. So it ends up in the next year, I think we're getting 26.2. Every year it's a little one way or the other. It's the always 26, and then it's either 26 right. plus something. Mm -hmm. What's up? Yeah. Come? No, I just didn't see that in every department, so I was wondering if it was unique to this department or something. Does it jive with other departments then? Well, every department has a budget of 26.2 if they're a 24 7 department, or 26.1 if they're a regular department. Because I think in this particular pay period, we had a Sunday and a Monday. Thanks. Sunday and a Saturday, probably. Yeah, I think that. Saturday and a Sunday. However, broke at the payroll. But every, every department has been adjusted for the required number of pay periods. We never used to have to do this. We only used to have to budget for 26 pay periods, but a couple of years ago, the Department of Revenue said they, they, they didn't want the timing, so the first paycheck you get in July is often for two weeks prior that were worked in June. So they want, they insisted that all communities then take that first paycheck in ju July and actually book it back to the previous fiscal year. So now, each fiscal year represents exactly the number of days that were in that fiscal year that will work. Uh, Council Murphy. Well, could you update us? I, I know one of the things that helps control overtime is keeping all of your positions filled. Mm -hmm. You want to update us? Because I know you've got people in the academy now and a couple more promotions coming and, and maybe another hire. So could you just let us know where we are with the new personnel coming up board? All the promotions are in place. So two captains, two lieutenants, two sergeants. So those will all then, as I described in public safety, we did over staggered a period of time so there wouldn't be such a dramatic change in everything. Plus it kind of stretched out the uh, number of officers we have in the street. Um, we've since hired back two Northampton police officers that were retired. One retired from the state police, wasn't our Hampton officer. And now he's working as a special fill in on downtown as well as uh, ex Sergeant Trusha. He's a special police officer. So that helps fill in somebody all the time. We started with eight people in the last academy class. One of them quit the afternoon of the first day. <laughs> There's no way you can replace them. We have seven that are going to graduate. We have full expectations. They're some of the best members of the class, and that's in two weeks. They will start their 16 week field training program. Um, we have we have four scheduled for the next academy, which is in August. We may be adding a fifth because I may have a retirement that someone's talking about. And I've got a fifth in the queue already. Of those four, one of them is an officer who was going to go to the academy, and a week before the academy started, he got called up and got deployed. He since come back. He's been back and been completing all his field training program in advance of the academy. So once he goes to the academy and gets the certification, he'll come back, probably do a couple day uh, review of any new policies that came out. He'll be ready for the street right away. And he's been doing a great job. So around about November, absent any other surprises, we will be back fully staffed for our allocated budget. And we still, from the last test, have some good, good folks in the queue should things happen, we can move. Mm -hmm. And I know in our budget book, there's still a vacant sergeant in that position, but they've been, people have been moved into those slots these, since this was done. These things were done yeah. in transition. The budget, the money's there, yeah. just not the name. Just not the name. Yeah. Okay. Council LaBarge. Uh, Chief, the DMH mental health first aid mm -hmm. and crisis intervention, mm -hmm. And you're still continuously doing that. Mm -hmm. Could you give me a little update on that about the training itself and how much is involved with that? Well, the, the uh, Mental Health First Aid was a grant that was first written um, using uh, Don Snyder, the state DPH, and we were a pilot project. And it was so successful, it's a 24 hour training. It actually teaches officers more uh, clinical diagnostic techniques 
So they're dealing with people on the street. You're not just using your classic law enforcement. You arrest them or summons them or whatever. Um, they're more able, better able to assist the people and divert them. It's called the Jail Diversion Program for DMH. And because we were so successful with our first group of, I think, 18 officers, we've since got everybody trained. And it was 24 hours, and it was paid for by them. We now have, based on that model, it is now a core curriculum of recruit academy. And some people, I think even Terry Masterson sent me an article about New York PD and New York Times saying New York PD is going to be doing this. So we're kind of a, a leader in that area. And the crisis intervention team is, is fewer people but at a higher level. We deal with you know, so many people trying to harm themselves, emotionally disturbed people, people with multiple substance abuse issues. We have a large population of traumatic brain injury, TBI folks from uh, the soldier on, the Army war veterans, and they exhibit signs and symptoms that you need a little more clarity about how to do and how to talk to them. And actually also buried in that is some autistic children, how to approach autistic children and, you know, not, not scare them, but get to the point and be able to help them. That level has given us the opportunity with several officers in every shift to be able to respond to some particular calls. And they end up, it's usually the same people, so they develop a relationship with this person. So now when we have the Section 12 Center, the clinical support options, the emergency services team, and it's a phone call. They go, yep, yep, you got that? Okay. It's in the facts. We call the ambulance, we take them up to the hospital, and everything's good. So it's really a, a home run because so much of our work is that kind of work. Right. And if you don't do it the right way, these people are repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, I think, Jesse, you wrote me an email once about some people that you talked about how impressive they Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, people in the mental health field yeah. and other departments. Yeah. So we, we like what we're doing. A lot of the other departments around us are adopting it. Um, of course, we did it with Grandma. And because of our success, we're going to keep increasing the training. Well, uh, thank you, Chief, and all your staff, officers, because it's not very easy out there. I've talked with many business owners. Every time I'm down in here, we have great concerns of what's occurring on the streets, and they are very happy. I talked with a couple of them last week in regards to where they talk to um, one of the new captains and so forth, and they feel now there's some better communication going on. So I want to thank you and your business. Um, I feel like I'm <laughs> I am going to apologize to anyone listening to this on NCTV. <laughs> it almost sounds so much, I mean, it's almost comical, and I'm sorry. This is because it's your tax dollars at work, and I think they knock off soon. Well, I think the contractors are fighting rain, so I just, oh, okay. That's true. That's true. There's a very nice space in Center Street with that, yes. Uh, we'll keep that in mind. Actually, traditionally these are held in uh, council chambers, but there's a conflict with the state. Uh, um, uh, other questions of the chief? Well, just just one, not so much budget related, but there's still is there still an outstanding building problem? I mean, we have we haven't totally signed off on all the systems. No, we haven't accepted ownership. We have a meeting tomorrow at ten. Well, the entire team came to the inspections. This is primarily water leaks for the garage. Uh, there's questions about the waterproofing, whether it was appropriate or putting it to money. <clears throat> time that we have the uh, city solicitor Seawall, the architect, the project manager, me, Unistress, and a couple of the other contractors um, coming together uh, after they did the inspection a month ago, and they're going to propose the, the plan to fix it. So I'm sitting on I think it's under a seventy-six thousand dollar check since uh, it's last year. Hmm? Unistress was the contractor for the garage. The, yeah. That's the Pittsfield thing. Yeah, Unistress, and then Armani did the waterproofing, and then there was another group. So it's we're done pointing fingers at each other. We've actually discovered where the problems are and how they need to be addressed. So uh, and that's where we're going to end up tomorrow. But they're not. I'm not closing out the <laughs> account. So they fix it because the next step will likely be uh, sorry, but we're going to use your money to fix the problem on our money. So we hope we'll have some progress on it. Council of Bark. Yes. I know once the um, police, police station was finished, 
I know when we went through our tour, we had seen a room that was not completed, which was for shooting and You're so right. forth. Yep. And Captain Conkis at that point had stated, I don't think you were with us, mm -hmm. what it would cost. So where do you do this? Where do we do if the you don't have now? a place. Yeah. Oh, we uh, pay a fee to the Northampton Water Club. We on the weekends when there's no school in session because they have a uh, arrangement that no outside shooting for the school. Mm -hmm. So all our rifles, uh, patrol rifles, simulations, etc., shotguns, uh, the contact cover drills that we do, which is pulling up in a car and working with another officer. It's all this stuff, uh, and also increased requirements of training by the Criminal Justice Training Council. We now have to certify three times a year. So we can do the outside stuff, the big stuff, it's an eight hour training for Oxford. And because we're going through this new recertification, there's a, a course that um, we do in their range. And they charge us $650 an afternoon. And we can only put eight to 10 people through that course. So we're, we're going through that right now um, to get the third phase of the training council requirements shoot don't shoot scenarios and low light firing and all that stuff. So yeah, the range is expensive, but the state's mandating more and more of this firearms training for liability reasons. It's much more complicated and it's good. You know, the more we can do, the better it is for the officers because they're comfortable with everything. Um, but now it's still a dream on the horizon and it's filling up with stuff that I can't believe how much. What, what would you say would be the total cost of completing that? Well, the, what we would like is the, it's not the top of the line version, but it's about 325,000. We mitigated the 100,000 by knowing that we didn't, um, weren't going to overspend the budget, so I had, I had 280,000 uh, in contingency fees. So we took 100 out of that and did the air handling unit for the roof. That's there. The duct works there. Everything's there ready to go. All we need is the bullet recovery system, the targets, and the lighting. And we'd be good to go. And bullet recovery is very expensive because it's hazardous material, you know, with lead, you know, with all kinds of other issues. So, I mean, we started a gift account. Um, everybody, Archer, mm -hmm. Archer signing to raise money. I think we got thirty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it was a start, but it didn't get us very far. Um, Council Shera, oh, Council O'Donnell, and then Council Connor. Would you be able to do all of that training in that room if it was complete? It sounds like some of the training you were describing was maybe done outside using vehicles and stuff. Would Only because of rifles. The, oh. the indoor range at um, the Revolver Club doesn't handle the, the, the air for trainings. So... Sidearms. Okay. Sidearms. Sidearms. Well, not even a shotgun. So shotguns are not. Their, their recovery system is set, set up for it. But that, the room at, in the department would be set yeah. up to handle everything. Anything and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything carry every phase of the training that we could do. Um, we even looked at, uh, well, we do another training uh, for the Blue Line, which is a, a bulletproof tractor trailer that comes in. And we go to the DPW and we ran everybody through the two-hour training with that, and it's all video-based scenarios. Mm -hmm. They call it shoot, don't shoot. You've got to identify a target as a good guy with a gun and a badge, versus a bad guy with a gun, or you know, a guy with a phone or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's live ammunition in this trailer. And that runs us sixteen hundred dollars a day and it takes us four days to run everybody through. So it's stuff that has to be done. It does build up in cost over time. Um, we had thought at one time I had a discussion with Smith College when they were thinking of arming their officers, um, that I would leverage some money from them as a as a gift to the city, receive money to start it, and then you know, hundred grand help us out and then we would by the instructors and train all the personnel, uh, or lease it out to other communities. But other communities don't have that rate either. They should be, everybody shoots outside. Right. So. And what happened with the talks with Smith? They decided not to uh, their staff convert it to the five to four college. The college public safety. Council Don. I just had a very quick question. It's the first time I'm seeing this, so. Um, the, the district attorney's anti-crime task force mm -hmm. that um, sounds interesting i was just wondering is this the first year we've participated in the program or just the first year we, we're donating or um, dedicating a, a full-time well, position to we had a regional task force uh, it was managed 
So you didn't feel PD, you ended up having, they ended up having some county problems. Um, so we kind of disbanded and walked away. Uh, we didn't want to be linked with that. Um, so the new DA wanted to get this going again. And he got a, I forget what it's called, some special community something grant. It's like only 80,000 bucks to start. So while we're getting up to $5,000 in overtime, I'm actually contributing somebody else full time to that program. And they work regionally because, you know, the drugs in Ashfield and Cummington and Amherst and Holyoke, and, you know, they all find their way to Northampton eventually. But the first year that we, we were dedicating one FTE to that program. Right. And it's an FTE based on their needs and Colin, if we need him for work, he, he, he's with us first. And ultimately, I assume it saves a lot of money participating in that in terms of what it prevents. We've had, they've had great success working this way. Um, and it, it's, not, it's a full-time equivalent. It's not just like a body that works with them full-time. Right. They use our uh, video forensic guys a lot to recover data for cell phones and uh, laptops and whatnot. When they, when they do an arrest, they see the people who were, were able to recover that. So the 40 hours a week adds up, but it's not just one body full-time. Councilor Yeah, just a quick question. So I know that the school resource officer position is eliminated. Is there, um, and, it, and you stay here due to staffing shortages, so is there, it, will that position be reestablished, or do you see that? I'm hoping. I mean, okay. by the end of this calendar year, if everything works out, you know, to these seven So your plan is to still have that? There. Right. You know, my first priority is to, uh, you know, because it's, it's two and a half people per ship, my first priority is to replace the vacant detective sergeant's position, because mm -hmm. it's sorely needed in there probably a, a, another detective, mm -hmm. and then I'll look at the SRO. Um, mm -hmm. so and then, um, so, then there's the reference to the Explorer post. Mm -hmm. So, um, is that, I know this is established in 2012, but isn't there a long history? I mean, I thought I saw a reference that Captain Clayton actually came to the police she department. She did, Joe Conkis started it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. In 1978, we started together. And it had a life and then it just faded away. Um, we ended up, it was more of a, a recruiting tool to try to get people interested, local people, etc. cetera. Um, so the school resource officer took that on. He's since walked away from the program and has been turned over to Sergeant Barsh, I believe, who has an interest mm -hmm. with it. So we're transitioning that program to, we're transitioning that program to another person. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Council of Yes. Crossing limits. I'm bringing that up again. I built in the budget the Ryan Road one. And looking at it at $53,196 and talking with you, you were hoping sometime that that would go into the school department. Mm -hmm. And you would do the full training, helping them out and so forth like that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever talked with the mayor about that? Mm -hmm. And well, we agreed. We agreed to do the Ryan Road one, and I absorbed it. I was able to absorb it in my budget. This budget reflects the addition of that. So we're up to ten and fifty-three hundred rupees. Our problem is finding people to do it, and we, we always have vacancies, and we have to pick and choose the, the lower priority, and either, you know, move the crossing guard to the higher priority, or if we have an officer recovery, we'll try to cover it. But I'm talking about taking it out of your budget because you would like to see it taken out of your budget and put in the school budget. Yes. <laughs> I mean, but it, right now it lives in my budget. Um, and I personally, if you're scheduling school buses and school days and everything, it seems like something that could be managed by the school. And they might have better luck with the you know, We do postings in the Council of Aging, Patty Shaughnessy, checking with people. I actually looked into the, the tax relief program where someone can volunteer and get some tax relief as an elder. but. They, they only do it in quarters. They wouldn't make enough money in that quarter, you know, working the hour in the morning and the hour in the afternoon. I mean, it, it just, I was like, ooh, ooh, yeah. But it, it wouldn't work out the way it's set up. Whether that, talking to Patty, it changes later that you can do a cumulative over a 12-month period of time. Maybe somebody would meet the threshold and would be able to fill the positions. But that's that looking like it's happening. Because I know you had concerns when I talked to you last year, Chief, mm -hmm. in regards of you wouldn't mind 
at that cross guarding position would come out of your budget and go in the school department. Yeah, it's not so much where it lives, it just in my belief, it seems like it'd be more appropriate to manage and schedule there. So, because it takes, you know, it's a desk officer, the 11 to 7 desk officer. You know, it's crossing guard calls in at 5 saying, I'm not coming. He's got to go through the very short list of people, and then it's like you can tell the supervisor. The supervisor's got to either hold somebody over on overtime mm -hmm. to cover a post, or if it's a little priority, and we're busy, we can't cover it. We can't cover it. Okay, so. okay just checking on it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, thank you very much for your presentation today. We appreciate your time. Thank you much. Thank you. Will I be required to attend? The, the council, uh, that's a reasonable question. The councilors have any uh, desire to have the chief be present tomorrow uh, for those two financial items? No. Finance items? Great. You're excused then from, it's going to be a quarter of a meeting. I don't know why you'd want to pass it up, but you know, suit yeah, yourself. I just got home from college oh, Georgia and my sister's going back well, you got Florida, your priorities. So one and a half seat, so that was my <laughs> Okay, all right. I got my you said, no, you got to go. <laughs> Works okay, that would be fine. All right. Next up, thank you all. Smith Vocational's here, and I'm gonna get you guys some chairs. I, I just wanted, you know, Councilor Adams asked about those two days of payroll. In the budget book, you'll only see that two days at, in the fire department budget and the police department budget. All the others incorporated it into each individual line item. So, but I, I, when you asked that, I realized there's only two budgets that actually call it out as two extra days of payroll. But everybody else actually did budget for 20, you know, 26.1. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, come on up. Smith Vocational is next. We're, we're pretty casual today. That's okay. <laughs> it's, I'm apologizing in advance. We have. They're uh, steam cleaning, grouting, routing, pile driving. They're doing on this side of the building, so you can hear that noise from time to time. We turned off the air conditioner so people can hear. Uh, can hear. Um, this is uh, Smith Vocational Super Superintendent Peterson and the chair of the Board of Trustees. Uh, Mike Cameron is here as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to come see us. And. Uh, I apologize, we had to turn off the air conditioning so people could hear as well, so. Still cooler than our Yes, <laughs> okay. All right, and if you just wanna just give a brief narrative and description yeah. about how your budget's shaking out. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for um, the board support and also the support of the city. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, the increased communication on my part with the mayor and, and I think we're working hard to, to really get a lot done and uh, he's been fantastic and I just wanted to thank him publicly uh, again as well as the support of the board so uh, as far as what we're doing this year what I brought is our schedule 19 and you, you may or may not be aware that uh, the, the money that the city contributes to our budget um, these are indirect costs so we don't necessarily get a check for the money but these are very important to pay for uh, our health insurance Things of that nature. Is this an envelope? The yeah. schedule 19? Yeah, that's 159. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, I, I believe you'll see it's right at the middle of the page. I highlighted my copy, but it says Smith uh, FYI, excuse me, FY 2015 cost factors, and right in the middle it says Smith School, and right at the bottom you're going to see the number that I believe the mayor budgeted for us this year. And again, I'm still looking for the sheet you're looking at. Okay. I just want to be looking at the same thing. Yep, it's one of the beginning of the That's just the beginning of the middle school. So. Oh, no. What does it say on the top of the page? Maybe that might help us. It says schedule 19 cost factors. I'm not sure what I'm thinking. So I, I, I have my budget anyway, so I can, I can use that. See if we have what you're looking at. Okay, good, good. Uh, you, you have a complete Smith Boat budget in their budget, so we you, you gave them whatever you put. So it's not the budget, I'm not sure. Okay, just looking at something. Okay, okay. just, yep. Yeah. 166. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, okay, it's just, there's something different right now. Yeah. I think it's a little bit different. Okay. 
no, I, I apologize. Oh, no, that's okay, but so would you ask us to look at a particular column just to help? I'm just letting you know that that's, that that's where it is. It, where? It's in the middle column, and again, I think What's we the have, name of the middle column? Uh, it says Smith School, 20%. You don't, you. Smith School, 20%. I'm lost. It's just hard to it's hard to look at if you're talking about something that you're looking yeah. at and where it's hard when you say middle of the column and we don't have the same thing. It's just hard to. Okay, I'm so sorry. So either that, either that, or we should just look at. Why don't you look at what we're looking at? Is that right? <laughs> I can make a copy of that. Oh, that may help. help. Yeah, we'd like to. Thanks. Also, Jeff, is if you want, this is the narrative for you guys on yeah. the. On your budget, starting there. We're looking at page 166. So, if I, I can move on if you don't yeah, 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 sure. Um, so, again, <coughs> that, that money is indirect cost. We don't actually see that money, so it's not money that we spend on programs. But some of the new programs that we're starting next year, we're starting a criminal justice program, uh, which is very exciting. And we're starting a, um, an interior design and furniture making program, which, which we're also excited about. Uh, these are things that we work with the Regional Employment Board and, and we talk to them about uh, job opportunities. And, and we think it's exciting. These are certainly criminal justice. There's nothing like that in the area, so we're going to be unique with that. And um, the, the cabinet making and furniture making, there's only three throughout the state. So we're doing things that are new and, and, and different. So that's exciting for us. Uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from it. And, and we're looking forward to those programs. Thank you. These are the first new programs that we've had at Smith in years. And since so exciting that that's in two years. But, uh, we're expanding. We're trying to get bigger. We're trying to get better. We're bringing night school courses. We're working with GCC and uh, the Greenfield Community College and the University of Massachusetts. And we're looking at bringing some uh, night school courses. Uh, there's been the Regional Employment Board has, has um, identified that there's a need for uh, not just high school students to work in the labor trade, certainly manufacturing, but for young adults as well, uh, career changers. There's a, there's a shortage in that field, and uh, we're hoping to open up our shops. I like to say 24-7, that's not realistic, but we want to open it into the nighttime so other members of the community can get in there, all right? Uh, we, we're also, which is very exciting, we just made a deal with Greenfield and with UMass to offer college credits right on our campus. And um, a student that enrolls in our school as a sophomore, they're going to be able to graduate with almost a year of college credits under their belt, free of charge. And uh, we're very excited about that. We're also opening this up to other folks from the community. So if you go to, to the University of Massachusetts and, and you live in Southampton, uh, you can come, you can take those courses right there on our campus. So a, a lot of great things going on. Um, the, the folks at those two schools have been very supportive of what we're trying to do. So we're, we're very happy that's happening. Um, we just received a lot of the things that we do it, it is through grants, certainly the equipment grants. And I think most of you saw that Governor Patrick just approved $1.3 million for equipment grants. And of that, we received $40,000. So every time we get these grants, and we, you know, we got uh, two this year, we got two last year. Every time we get these grants, we update our, our machinery because unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that we have is, is pretty long in the tooth. So we're using that constantly to update our, our uh, equipment to make sure that the kids have uh, state-of-the-art equipment to work on so when they go into the field, they're going to be well prepared. So that's a big funding source for us, the grants. And right now, vocational education, as you probably know, it's very, very hot. Um, not only here in Massachusetts, but, but nationwide. Uh, you know, our enrollment is up. Um, this year, for next year, we have a record number of Northampton kids that are applying to go to the school, uh, which I think is a great thing. We have almost 60, 60 kids applying for uh, admission as, as, as a freshman next year. And uh, I think that the word is getting out that we really have a quality education to offer. And not only can you come in and get a trade and hit the job force, you can also go to college. And we have kids that are going to college. And you really can get a, to get both of those right at our school. And 
we're, we're trying to get that word out, and uh, I think we've been okay with that. We've been successful with that. Um, again, things are very happy. Uh, things are. Very, I am very happy with the way things are going this year. It's been a great year. Uh, I've enjoyed working with the mayor and, uh, of course, the chair and, and the entire board of trustees on how we can really bring the school forward. And uh, I appreciate your support. That's all I have. If you have so, any questions, uh, there seems to be uh, Councilor Carney and Councilor Lavar. Well, may not be the only one, but first of all, I'm really excited about your uh, collaborations once again with Greenfield and yeah. UMass because, as we all know, it used to be a great program. With so many uh, post, it used to be a whole post grad program at yeah. Smith Folk right. previously where people could get, um, you know, some of the requirements towards any of the licensable trades yeah. or things like that. So that's that's really good. And in terms of the articulation that you have now, I guess it's with, with Greenfield. Yes. So that's, um, I think you just said people could get up to a year. Up to a year. So that's, so basically by virtue of their related coursework, would they get, or is it kind of advantage? Right, it's a very good question. So we're offering, starting next year, a seventh period, we're calling it. We have six periods a day. So we're offering a seventh period. And these are actually courses that, uh, that, that UMass and GCC have identified as uh, courses that they have high enrollment for, yet they don't have the space. So in the, in the fall, we're having a Spanish, which is something we haven't had before, a foreign language. So, so a, child, yeah, a child will be able to take Spanish, um, receive high school credit, and also receive four college credits. Mm -hmm. All right, so it, it's not, they don't get it through their related courses. These are above and beyond what they're okay. doing. All right, uh, so we're gonna have Spanish next year. We're gonna have an engineering course, and uh, we're gonna have a botany course. Uh, which is we do a lot of work with with the animal science but we don't do a lot with the plant science mm -hmm. and that's something that's going to uh, help help the portfolio of our kids when they get out and again we work with the school of stockbridge at umass and greenfield is really hot on agricultural education right now and they're really trying to grow their program and they're trying to tap into what we're doing so we can really help them with their programs and hopefully get our kids into college saving a lot of money mm -hmm. So a couple of things. Um, I know that you reported that really, really high results in MCAS. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> in addition to the MCAS, though, that people don't often realize is so the Smith Folk students have not only all the MCAS requirements, but the Certificate of Occupational Proficiency. Right. So um, are you finding that you know you have as successful completion in, in that regard in terms of that certificate? Or? What, to my knowledge, 100% of our kids are graduating uh, proficient in their trades. What happens is by the time they enter the shop as a freshman, they're tracked and they have a, a book, a, check, a checkbook. And uh, if you're an auto mechanic, they would say, um, is able to read the timing light, uh, is able to use a, a, a wrench to change a tire, and we check all those off, all right, and that becomes a part of their portfolio. So yeah, uh, it, it, it's a process over the three and a half years that they're in their shop, and uh, when they graduate, they're, they're proficient in that because they've done those competencies. We show these to the people that are in the industry, and th they say, I'll hire this, this kid right now because they're coming there with this, uh, with this dossier that other people in the industry just don't have. So the kids that are coming through our schools are just so, they're so much ahead of, uh, of, of other folks that aren't. I have people calling me. I had somebody call me two weeks ago from Greenfield saying that they need 30 kids in their manufacturing shop tomorrow. Right. We don't have it. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have that many kids. Um, the next week I had somebody say, so from Westfield say that they could use 20. So that's 50 kids and, and we don't have 50 kids in the program, certainly not that are old enough to go out as juniors and seniors. So our kids are getting placed, they're getting jobs, they're getting well paying jobs and the employers are very happy. And this should be my last question then. So I know there's often been a lot of talk about um, wanting to have more participation, collaboration between the school systems. Yeah. So for example, making more opportunities for uh, Northampton High students, for example, to yeah. get some, and without watering down, without assuming that you can just go for a month yeah. and get you know, a, a, a course and, right. and, or learn how to be an auto mechanic. That, right. that the school actually, you know, you really do need to study for three and a half years solidly to have those credentials. Yeah. What kind of, kind of in-between area have you explored for even life skills or basic, I don't know. So, so basics, how to change a tire even for 
you know, for opportunities for there to be more collaboration among the, right. the two schools. And um, many of the surrounding districts ask the same question. We would love to send the kids to Smith, but we'd like to send them there for two periods a day. Um, and we've talked about that, about ways to do that, but we just don't know how that would fit into the Chapter 74 curriculum because there's frameworks that we have to follow. And uh, if we don't follow those frameworks, then, then we're not compliant in Chapter 74. We'll just touch on that. One of the things that we're looking at <clears throat> that is, uh, I know it's hard to believe that I went there a few years ago, but the, the thing is they had night courses and they're coming back. <clears throat> and we're looking at that to identify not only uh, a service to the to the public, but people want to know how to change tire, mm -hmm. and and they they would come to a night class to learn that, and and it would be a skill set that they'd be able to have to help them, or you know uh, either a spouse or children, and uh, so we're investigating that. And some of the the curriculum that we had been able to provide years ago at night, we're reidentifying, and uh, Maggie Gifford uh, at the school is working with uh, to see what it would cost to run a night program, to see who's available for instruction and what we would charge uh, for that course. So that is in process as we speak, so I think that helps uh, with a question. Council LaVarge? Yes. Um, you mentioned about how your enrollment is up. Okay. Okay. I would like to talk about the enrollment sure. versus how many students are from the outside? What is yep. the number? Yep, we have, right now, we have 89 students from Northampton. And uh, that's total in the school? Total in the school, yep. And, uh, and outside? Uh, three, 320, 322, I believe. And you're saying that next year we're going up another 60 from Northampton? Uh, this current year's freshman class, we have uh, the highest number of Northampton kids of any of the, of the three grades, okay? Uh, when I came here, I, I, I told the board that I wanted to get more Northampton kids in here, and I had the conversation with the mayor. Uh, I think that's important for us to, to serve Northampton, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, in the past, I think that's gone down. Those numbers have been low, but... but uh, we want more Northampton kids. This, this is our community, we feel. Where are they going? Well, they go to the high school. They go to Northampton High School. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. If they don't come to our school, they go to the high school. As far as I know, I think, I don't know much about the charter school conversation, but mm -hmm. I, I think that's mm -hmm. uh, in play. But, um, you know, we had last year about 45 applicants for this year's freshman class. And uh, about 30, I want to say about 30 of those kids chose to come. And this year we have about 60, so we're up to about 25% in our interest from, uh, from the Northampton kids, which I'm very happy about, and I'd like to see that number continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Also, too, um, I've had some people questioning about way back, Michael, which you remember, they had the LPN nursing class there. And I do know with the literacy project, we have brought that up about Greenfield Community College, yep. looking at bringing that nursing back. Are, is there any feedback about this? Yeah, it, it, we talk about that program, and that we did once have that, and uh, I think the program you're talking about was a post-grad program. Am I mm -hmm. correct? Am yeah. I correct? Okay. So we had a post-grad uh, program, or we had post-grad students that would come during the school day. Yeah. McCann Peck does that right now, and they have a great program. So they would come during the school day, and they would learn alongside of our kids, and I would love love to see that happen um, I'm sure Mike would tell you this more so than anybody but I need to I, I need to slow myself down because I want to do all these things and um, it's just not possible right now so yes that's something that I want to do I want to add more programs and an LPN program is certainly something I want to do uh, dental hygienist operating room assistant as far as that area goes we're right next door to the hospital Mm -hmm. and, and those are things that I want to do, but I, I just can't do it all at right. once. Right, you could make a bridge away. between the hospital and right. the hospital. Right, we're now working with the hospital in that regard. Yeah. Uh, our health tech students uh, get used by other nursing homes as well as the Cooley Dixon. Any uh, medical opportunity that we have, they're calling us like, they're calling for mechanics and machinists, and, yeah. 
and uh, but my sister Maureen went to that LPM program, so I, I knew it. I knew it well. And uh, and the thing is that uh, we are identifying uh, needs, right. and through working with the employment people, they want uh, more EMTs. They want uh, medical people in that regard. Uh, so we're trying to identify right now and put together a list for the future. And the future becomes today because the demand factor is there. Exactly. And and as Jeff says, you know, we're excited about a lot of new things coming. We have to just prioritize and then make sure that we have the, 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 the students to fill those classes if we're going to offer them, and as well as having the uh, money and financial wherewithal. Right. Because I think with the health care, that is really a big problem out there today. I think that that would be the greatest thing for Smith Vocational to get back and open up those doors because many people are asking, is the nursing program ever going to come back? Yeah. Well, our health tech people, I was in a meeting the other day while we were at our awards ceremony at Lock Park for the seniors. And uh, <clears throat> in every, uh, it wasn't just ladies, it was a gentleman that was in the health tech class. They've all been hired. Uh, and they're, they have different degrees already for being able to draw blood and do different things. So mm -hmm. when they go in, it's, it's entry level, but at the same time, they have a lot of information that they can hit the ground running to be able to provide services today. So we're excited about that. And, and, and the unique thing about being on board is that students will come to me after they graduate. And when they're at school, just like the rest of us, you know, we kind of looked at the teacher and knew that we had homework and, you know, how you doing today and you kind of get the shrug. Mm -hmm. But these kids are so excited afterwards. When they graduate, they come to me and said, I get the best education. Mm -hmm. So that's our, you know, our real feedback in regards to the people that are getting hired. And we always say that if you want to see our Smith alumni, look in the yellow pages. So that's where they're hired. You know, they either have their own business, they've gone to work for somebody, but they have a career level that they can attain. Yeah. And uh, that program has been growing, and I, I had to hire another teacher this year because the American Medical Association only allows 10 students per one certified instructor. And uh, I, I had to say no to kids, and that's something that we don't want to do. So we, we expanded the size of the classroom, we allowed more kids in, and we hired another teacher in there. So that's a, a huge need for us right now. Okay. Councilor Adams and then Councilor Wadon. Okay. Uh, Criminal Justice Program. That sounds very interesting. Uh, be a, it sounds like it could be a, a real draw for s yeah. students. Okay, is, was there any, anything else you could, any more description you could give about that? Uh, nine years ago, Braden New Bedford began a pilot criminal justice program. Okay, and uh, just this past year, uh, it received Chapter seventy four approval from the state as as, a, as, a, as an approved shop, and. Um, <clears throat> It was new to me last year, and I, I spoke to the instructor at a conference, and uh, she said that it's a, it was a great compliment to the programs that they have, okay? And I started thinking about it, and I started talking to the team, and uh, since I've been there, which is a short time, I, I, I talk to the kids and say, hey, what are you doing when you get out of here? I say, I want to be a police officer. You know, I want to work for the FBI, I want to work for the CIA. So I'm saying, we have all these kids that want to do this, yet we don't have a, a training ground for them to do that. So to me, it seemed like a good fit for us, for us to go in that direction. Um, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna start with only freshmen next year, we're gonna grow with it, uh, we're gonna add a sophomore the next year, and so on. So it's not gonna be a full scale, we're gonna allow everybody in. It's gonna, it's gonna start as, a, as, as freshmen, we're gonna uh, write the curriculum, we're going to write lesson plans, and, and it's going to grow. And we hope that this is going to be one of our strongest shops. I will say that right now, the applications that we're getting, we ask the, the, the potential eighth graders to rank what they want to do, and criminal justice is our, our top choice. And we've never offered it. We've never offered it before. It's our top choice. So we're excited about it. Okay. Uh, Councilor Dow. I just, I'd like to say, first of all, I'm always really impressed by the range of things that you offer Thanks. and hope to offer. Um, and I'm always, I always consider it a huge asset for this, uh, for this community. I was just curious about one item I want to ask you about. 
uh, which was athletics. Right. It seems like you're, you're undergoing a substantial increase in how much you spend on it. And you're going to spend roughly twice what you spent last year. Sure. And compared to two years ago, it's like nine times as much. So sure. it's like a yeah. big increase in athletics. So my question is, given the, you know your, your mission, um, putting people on the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what your philosophy is um, in terms of athletics, what value yeah. that brings. And My philosophy on that is I want kids that come to our school to have the same opportunities at Smith that they have at every other school. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first got there, there was, there was five sports. And uh, <clears throat> I felt that area was lacking. And I also felt that if the kids had more opportunities, then we would get more kids to enroll in our school, all right? Um, so far, I've, I've seen that. Last year, after only adding two sports, uh, our enrollment had, was up about 20%, and that was just for incoming freshmen over the year before, all right? And from what we're seeing now, uh, it looks to me like our enrollment is gonna be up at least that this year, and our recruiter that goes out and, and does the interviews for these kids, they say that they want to come and they want to play sports, and that's a big draw for them. So for us, for, for our school, everything is about recruiting and getting kids in the doors because we don't have a, a set budget, which is good and it's bad, um, but we don't have money that's guaranteed to us. And without getting kids in the doors, we can't operate. So whatever I can do to give the kids opportunities to get them in the doors, that's my mission, that's my goal. Thank you. Yep. Council of Art. Yes. You're talking about um, your goal of going out and recruiting. It was an article in the paper. I haven't seen it. Somebody had told me today when I was just sitting out the bench out there. Sure. And um, what, what's that all about? Um, we, I think there was a misunderstanding between one of our young coaches who, who had you get that under being looked at, and, and I don't want to reveal information in regards to I don't mind that the article's in there. We're working to, re, to work with the town of Amherst that, that had the problem, that put the article in the paper, but we have not had direct conversation. So I want to identify what they're saying is a problem, because I don't know if it's a problem. Okay, so, so this it's is only something it's, new that's it's something new that came out of the morning paper. I was not aware of it before all this. Uh, I'd like to take time to evaluate it and then to respond to it because I think that that their athletic department, mm -hmm. the the trustees, and the principal and the superintendent need to have a conversation about it before we talk about it in public. Okay, if you would bear with me. That's fine. Thank like you. I said, it's brand new to me, Michael. Yeah, yeah me too. The, um, are there other questions? The, uh, your tuition has increased it from has. sending communities about 14%, is that right? It, it, it went last year from 16.8 to 18.2, so if that's, if that's what the percentage right. was. Right, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, right. Uh, we were surprised. I know that we voted, and I agreed with the mayor, uh, that we need to, Traditionally, Smith has charged less than, than the state recommended tuition rate. Uh, for Northampton? For, 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 yeah. for outside districts, yeah. Okay. And uh, so the board voted before the actual number came out to, to charge the full rate this year, okay? And uh, I, I was expecting the state rate to be about 17.2. And uh, when it came out as 18.2, we were, I think, pleasantly surprised, but also at the same time, I think that that, that hurt a lot of our sending districts. And uh, that's kind of a PR thing I've been working on, too. Right, so this, uh, yeah, the le leads into my next question, is that impact on your yeah. enrollment and your recruiting? You know, it could, it could hurt us. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna play out until next year. Right. But it, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money to send, a, to send a kid here, and that's why we really need to be great at what we do or else they're not gonna send them here. You know, uh, the state sets the rate for every vocational school in the state. <clears throat> we're, we're about the middle of the road. I mean, some places it's $22,000, dollars uh, It costs about $19,000. Our, our, our uh, PPE is about $19,000, which is a little bit above what we're getting in tuition. And uh, we get about um, 
we, we get about, I want to say roughly $17,000 when you break it down per kid from Northampton. So it, it, yeah, it's a lot of money and we hope that it doesn't. I mean, because the state rate's usually set by proximity to Boston, of course, right. and, and this part of the state, you're sending districts, no um, greater poverty and they have, For they sure. have greater challenges For consequently. Sure. sure. And you're uh, I'm clearly, obviously, you guys are sensitive to that and you're going to try and figure out where's the tipping point um, and how it adver adver once the point comes when it adversely impacts your enrollment right. and also your ability to function. I could touch on that. The, uh, <clears throat> because of the competitive nature today of schools in regards to uh, working with, if, if they're offering the same programs, then we gotta get competitive. Right. But what I see as a former business owner and uh, being on the board is you gotta sell value, not price. So do I wanna apologize for, for what it costs to go to that school? No. But I wanna make darn sure that the value of what that student's gonna get out of it and the sending district has to realize that because when you're you know voting on a budget and how many students you're going to send to Smith School, and it's based on a dollar value, then all of a sudden the value gets washed out of the career path that that student's going to get in their future. And if they're restricted because of monetary situations, they're, they're the one that's going to take the hit on it. So and, your and challenge is spreading the gospel. Yeah, that's okay. what we're out there ringing the bell. Matter of fact, we go to uh, arrive at Vibes for the Chamber of Commerce. We deal with many chambers of commerce. We get out into communities in South Smith School. We were at Lock Cabin recently. So things were never done before that they were just accepted right. that the kids are going to come to school. Not today. It's very competitive. Okay, That's just okay. a follow up to that. So every district has to provide vocational education opportunity for any student that, that wants it, but they could choose, as East Hampton, for example, could choose to send kids to Holyoke instead of sure. Northampton sure. Um, if, the, if, if the cost um, were that much Absolutely. that much of a difference. But as you're saying, I mean, the, uh, it is a good point that if they look at the difference between 17000 and 18000 but the value is is really that much better. They, th it, it is then the decision of that district, though, not pupil by pupil, but um, overall as to which direction they'll send students. Is that correct? Uh, East Hampton. So they've always come to Smithville. They have. And, uh, I thought we were going to Westfield for a while. Oh, West. They're, West going, they're going, West they're going to the lower pioneer of the okay. West Springfield. Okay. What, what they have down there is a half day program, and it's, yeah. uh, it's half the price. Of what we're offering, mm -hmm. so uh, they have elected to, to go that route, and uh, mm -hmm. this is this is something that. Uh, How long ago was that? Going, going there, back to value, is they they it's a half a, a day class, and they spend the other half day on buses coming and going, mm -hmm. so they've actually lost four hours of school, that that they could have been getting an education, and they're on a school bus, yeah. so that's part of the value picture to show to different school systems where, you know, how much student value of education are they really getting? Yeah. So are there no Stanton awesome. students at Smith? We do. In 2006, we had about 135. So those that choose a program that's not offered at exactly. Pioneer Valley. Correct. Exactly. So if you want to go into something. plumbing, which they okay. don't offer, right. they're allowed to come okay. here. So. And they do their, they try and have them do their academics in East Hampton, and then they just do their shops there, right? That's correct. But they, they jump on a bus. And then you add the transportation on top of all of it. Any other questions? Gentlemen, I appreciate your time. You. Thank, Thank you for taking the time to come present to us. Uh, as Dave Pomerantz has just stepped out here, he's up next uh, from Central Services. Hope he'll be back. Is he up on the lift earlier? He will. I noticed the noise stopped when his scheduled time showed up, but we, we can ask him. He's got the power. Yeah, <laughs> David, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Hi, thanks. Thank you. 
Next up, we have uh, Central Services. David Pomerantz is here. Uh, and thank you, first of all, for coming. And, uh, uh, and actually, we're pretty close to schedule so far. We uh, Just to give everyone a heads up, at 7 o'clock, the Youth Commission is having a recruiting meeting in this room. With pizza. With pizza. So you're all invited to stay, actually. And, and there will be food here. <laughs> you're welcome to stick around. David, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, okay. everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, Pam said I had to be here in the notice. That's right. So <laughs> don't say no to Pam. Don't. So what I'd like to do is um, do an overview on the central services budget for fiscal 15, highlight some of the key areas, um, and also include in that some information on the parking maintenance division, which is now under central services and then certainly entertain any any questions from uh, from the group what page what page 46 in your hymnals <laughs> okay so we'll talk about the central services budget first and run through some uh, notes about both uh, PS and the operations and maintenance side. Um, no increases or decrease in personnel for fiscal 15, both on, in central services and the parking division. So we're still looking at about a staff of 55, uh, covering both administrative management and uh, custodial maintenance, as well as city electrician, HVAC tech, and energy officer. Um, you'll notice under PS and central services that there is a custodian weekend pool at JFK position. Uh, we move that uh, from the NPS budget over to central services since that really is a central services position. It's a 19 and a half hour position, gives us a little bit better control. Uh, so we move that from NPS this year over to central services. Um, I can give you percentages uh, if, if you need them, but just to sort of refresh your, your memories about the fact that we have a number of positions in central services that are sort of multi-department funded. Uh, we have the mail courier, uh, the HVAC tech, the city electrician, uh, the facilities project coordinator um, that are all funded between Smith Folk, the city general fund, uh, and the DPW and NPS. Uh, and that's because basically the work that we do is, is spread that far across the board and uh, we use some sort of percentages based on how much time the staff is spending on in, in those particular departments doing uh, what we do on a daily basis. Um, the other thing I'll note under PS is that Chris Mason, the energy officer, uh, Chris works 35 hours a week. Five hours of that time is funded by the Northampton Housing Authority. Uh, we have a, an MOU with the Housing Authority where Chris spends five hours a week providing technical services and, and assistance as far as developing and implementing energy conservation programs and looking at developing renewables for NHA, NHA facilities. Uh, the program worked really well last year and John Height was very energetic about refunding that this year. Um, so Chris is again working with NHA. And we just finished the first year of a new uniform policy in conjunction with the DPW. Uh, we had some bumps in the road to, to get out of that program. Uh, but uh, Cintus, the, the vendor, uh, seems to have gotten things together. Uh, it's a good program, and I'm going to be expanding it this year for some of the other staff, including the parking maintenance staff. Uh, saves on their personal clothes and uh, gives us a look of professionalism as well as security uh, when, we're, when they're in and out of the buildings and facilities. What does that include? Just, uh, uh, did I put the is it just the outer clothing? It's, uh, it's t-shirts, uh, jeans, uh, and a, uh, either a jacket or a sweatshirt, all with the city logo. And footwear? Uh, they get a boot allowance oh. as part of the union contract. Right. Uh, so that's, that's separate. That's not part of the uniform oh. policy. Uh, so they're, uh, and everybody seems to have liked it as far as the first year goes. So. We'll be continuing expanding that. Um, a couple of notes uh, as we start to move into the OM side under utilities. Um, we're looking at going out to bid this summer for electricity and natural gas contracts. We have contracts now that will expire sometime late fall uh, for both electricity and natural gas. These are 18 to 24 month contracts uh, and based on 
trending. Uh, we're looking at probably small increases in costs for fiscal 15, we'll probably do 18 to 24 month contracts. Uh, we, tie, we try to tie them into the budget cycle, uh, makes things easier as far as projections. And what I, what I do want to note is that uh, since 2010, when we implemented the first year of construction for the uh, energy performance contract with Con Ed Solutions, until now, uh, across all city facilities, uh, both NPS and the city and Smith Folk, we've looked at decreases of about 25 to 28 percent in both electricity and natural gas consumption. Uh, we can't regulate price, although we try to do that through our bidding, but we've certainly, and hats off to Chris Mason for his, his work with constantly developing new projects to drive down our usage, um, 25 to 28 uh, percent as a result of the energy performance contract. And um, that's, that, that's, that's a great number. Um, and just once one note, um, oil used to be a, a major player uh, in the city as far as heating is concerned, with the exception of a greenhouse and a small building at Smith Folk and uh, a couple of small buildings at the wastewater treatment plant. Oil is no longer an energy source in, in the city of Northampton uh, as far as municipal operations are concerned. We've basically converted everything to natural gas. Um, so big, big gains in that area as well. Um, Again, I mentioned we'll be looking at probably some small increases on the electricity solicitations, uh, but again, it depends on what the, the market looks like later this summer when we go out for, uh, for contracts. Um, one note I'd like to make as far as just the general OM, uh, repairs and maintenance, uh, both uh, maintenance on an ongoing basis and electricity and HVAC repairs for central services. Um, we have, between our licensed and certified maintenance and uh, electricity and carpentry staff and, and HVAC, uh, we are doing more and more in-house work now, uh, doing our own construction and renovation projects. Uh, we're basically you know, pulling permits in conjunction with the building department, and what that's doing is allows us better control on the work that we're doing. We're not having to go out and bid for using prevailing wages. And um, just to give you a sort of an, a broad brush of, of how many projects we've done this year on top of ongoing daily maintenance, uh, Central Services staff this year renovated the Human Resources Department, the Veterans Department, retirement offices, the Assessor's offices, the Old Treasurer's offices, and they're in the middle of doing the Parking Collector offices right now. Uh, that's on top of their their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so, well, what personnel do you use then? This is our this is our in-house staff. So the oh, as I'm looking, so is it the so you're talking maintenance supervisor and the maintenance and maintenance staff. Custod okay, yeah. so the and custodians that are listed here. Those we'll we'll pull the custodians in for moving okay. uh, when we're swapping offices back and forth. Uh, but you know most most of the uh, maintenance staff all have their construction supervisor's licenses. Okay. Um, so we're doing more and more of that in-house. Susan. Um, I just wanted to, well, before you leave utilities, one of the big increases in your budget was the uh, stormwater. Yes, I was going to mention that. Uh, thank you. Um, you'll notice that that's uh, both on, under parking maintenance and central services. That's a new line item this year based on the, the new program, the DPW program. The, so the money that are assessed the city are run through here. So that's city yeah. government. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just like we pay uh, water and sewer bills uh, and the money gets cycled through, we'll now be doing stormwater uh, starting July 1. A uh, couple of notes about other both efficient and, and money-saving programs that we do at Central Services. Uh, most of these have been in place for some time. However, one is a new one. Um, they end up uh, basically saving the city money. Uh, they allow us to run the programs very efficiently uh, and gives us great pricing because we're centralizing all these operations. So briefly, uh, we're looking at just finishing the first year of three on the new trash contract for the city. Uh, we work with alternative recycling systems. In fact, I met with them today to review the first year. Um, they're doing both Smith Folk, NPS, uh, and the city facilities uh, as far as recycling, trash, and uh, composting at three of the six schools. Um, so we had some bugs to work out the first year with them, but uh, again, very efficient program. 
Some of the other ones, uh, you've heard me talk about these before. We have a centralized photocopying program, so we have 14 photocopiers spread around the city. Uh, we have a five-year lease. First three years are free maintenance, uh, so big savings there. And we're getting departments to do more and more of their printing through the copiers, and which is gonna allow us to move away from the individual desktop printers. Um, office supplies and custodial supplies. Uh, this is a long-term program we've done between the city and NPS, uh, where we go out for bulk bidding uh, in the spring and the summer for both custodial and office supplies, lock in the prices, and then we order and distribute those materials and supplies over the course of the year. Um, and again, at, as, a, as a result of uh, uh, big savings in, in our pricing and a much smoother operation uh, as far as securing those products. And then the last one under centralized programs, I'll just mention, um, we have a uh, very in-depth, uh, uh, what we call contracted and inspection services program. This provides us with everything from elevator inspections, uh, sprinkler system inspections, uh, fire extinguishers, generators for both NPS and the city facilities. And again, we go out at the end of every May, June period for uh, uh, new contracts. Um, so we're, we're asking vendors for multi-building pricing as opposed to having every department go out and do it on their own. It results in, in some significant savings. Uh, that, that program, as well as custodial supplies, we're looking at probably at least a 10-year history on having done that, uh, again, with, with marked savings. A couple of comments on the parking maintenance division, which Central Services took over a year plus ago. Um, again, like Central Services, no increases or decreases in personnel. They have, it's a four-person staff. And uh, um, under utilities for parking maintenance, we'll be looking at, uh, again, probably small increases in electricity costs. Uh, this is covering the, the parking lots as well as the garages. And, but we're going to be offsetting those price increases in supply by uh, looking at savings through the LED lighting that we've been uh, installing in the garage and uh, some of the other lots. So we should pretty much be zeroing out as far as any increases. Under OM for parking maintenance, um, the, the tasks remain the same, but I just want you to note that the increase in uh, the budget line for that category uh, is going to change in two areas. One is the stormwater charges that I just mentioned under central services, and the other is that we'll be going out for a new citywide uh, telephone emergency notification system this year. Uh, the money comes through the parking division, uh, however, it's the emergency dispatch center at fire uh, that will be coordinating the bidding and implementation of that program. So the $28,000 you're looking at for that line, that's what that's going to be going for in fiscal 15. So we're sort of a conduit uh, at, at parking for that pro project. And then um, under non-parking maintenance, the last items uh, dealing with, uh, we have the bid assessment. Uh, that's, a, that's a steady funded line item. Uh, that $35,000 pretty much is the same every year. Um, and then your equipment lines that you're looking at uh, covers everything from uh, equipment that the maintenance guys use in the garage, uh, vehicles, uh, the parking machines that, you, that are in the lots. Um, it used to cover, uh, and shortly it won't anymore, the uh, infamous uh, cards for the gate access system at the garage. Uh, we will be looking at the new system being installed for that in about 10 weeks. Uh, so we have a vendor and uh, we'll be moving on that. So uh, that, that will be a big plus. That's basically a quick overview and uh, hey, Okay, all right. I guess there's some questions for you. Sure. Uh, we'll work our way around the room then now. Okay. Councilor Carney and then Councilor O'Donnell. And quick one. I'm just curious because the maintenance assistance in the parking division has a look back at here too. Yeah, and I noticed that. So, um, and those are probably targets. So the three maintenance assistants, um, are two are two are non-represented, the full time, and the maintenance assistants uh, half time is an absent. What accounts for the difference? Why why do we have non-represented? He is part of his duty as a part of his enforcement officer. 
So his oh, the two, the two, the two that are non-represented, or the one who is represented. The one who is represented. Oh, I see. So, um, it, so, but uh, so, <coughs> it's the parking enforcement officer piece that gives him representation, and um, yes. and so why are the other maintenance assistants not represented? I'm just curious. They're not represented. I understand that, right. but why? They do, they don't do any PEO work. Hmm. They don't do any par parking, parking enforcement. enforcement. Okay. Like, I can yeah, yeah. Just I'm just curious. Um, just what it's just uh, you know when the did the, um, the, when the I guess when the parking division was created and yeah. these uh, maintenance staff were hired, they were just hired as non-represented employees, and over time they've just opted to stay as non-represented employees, and they haven't been um, uh, I guess invited into the union. I mean name would probably be the most analogous, the, the union that they would probably be in. That's mostly DPW Not workers. AFSCME? No, AFSCME is clericals. Uh, oh, I we see. Have a, oh, okay. We I have see. a Northampton Association of um, Maintenance municipal, employees. Maintenance municipal, employees. municipal employees, and that's generally what um, all the DPW folks are in. Okay. So, but yeah, but this is, it is one of those anomalies of the creation of the parking division a few years ago. Because um, there's a number of them also, I just noticed too, in the, for central services that are in the, just the regular. Some are in name, some are in NACE, because they're, if they're affiliated with the school, they're in oh. the school custodial. Not a big deal, it's just, just yeah. curious. But we try, we do try to mirror some of the benefits that, you know, like the uniform allowance, for example, was yeah. negotiated under the name contract, but as Mr. Pomerantz said, we're extending that to their employees as well, so so that there's parity at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Council down, Council Murphy and Council Labar. I'm all, I'm all set. You're all set, Council mm -hmm. Murphy. Um, so our commitment to the bid was a flat rate because I know they they reduced their fee to everybody else, but our so we that wasn't a fee, it was a flat contribution because I noticed it hasn't really changed. It's, it's in, in my time here, it's been thirty five thousand. Right. It's in an MOU that was negotiated. Yeah. So it's not, city, and um, we're we're currently reviewing that MOU. Um, Memorandum city, of understanding for yeah. those of you playing um, at home. The way the, bid, the way the bid law works is that if you're with nonprofits, they do. MOUs with them, Rather so that's part of the original MOU, and we're in. Mm -hmm. We're actually going through that MOU right now, and mm -hmm. and um, so that may be one of the items going forward that may be changed. We don't know. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Councilor Murphy, you want to? I'm also Councilor Barge. Yes, um, David. I know I have talked with you on the phone in regards to the difficulties, problems we're having in some of the schools about cameras mm -hmm. on the outside of the buildings and I really feel that's a priority because of what is occurring lately with our schools and especially what has been occurring at Ryan Road School. When will all of our schools have outside cameras? Because I think this would eliminate problems of vandalism going on, being able to video and see who these people are that are causing the damage. Well, I can tell you that. I mean, we've had, what, two weeks of a break right now? Mm -hmm. And it's just not Ryan Road, but other schools too. And I'm just curious about talking with the principal to feeling that cameras should be placed on the outside. And I agree with that. Well, we've got capital projects slated for JFK for work this summer. That's ready and set to go. The high school's been taken care of with upgrades. Um, Greg Kohan, the maintenance supervisor, has met with the principal at Ryan Road, and they're working on looking at uh, locations around the building for cameras there, since because of the incidents that have happened there. Yes. Um, we're talking about uh, Bridge Street as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as either capital requests are funded, or we're looking at um, working with the superintendent's office on expanding overall security uh, systems in each of the schools and using possibly some building fund money to implement projects like the cameras, like alarms on the doors, where we don't have them now. So it, it's a work in progress, uh, but I know that, that Greg has met with um, the principal at Ryan Road and they're actually scoping out locations four cameras around the perimeter. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Pomerantz? 
Um, David, I'd just like to say once again, um, you know, it's pretty dazzling. I don't, I don't think a lot of people appreciate essentially the fact that you are integral to the warp and weave of the function, the regular functioning of the city, and that you've done amazing transformations in your tenure here and have saved us significant monies. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's frequently taken for granted and uh, just want to say we don't take it for granted. So I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. And uh, my staff thanks you. Yeah, I mean, my only knock would be the steam cleaning going outside the window up and it seemed to stop miraculously when you're, you're, you were queued up for testimony. I don't know if that's a coincidence or, but we'll, we'll let that lie. <laughs> so thank you again. Yes. Council of Oh, yes. Council of And I want to thank you again, David, which I have before, and to all of your staff. I think you're all doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yes. Thanks for your time. Now, well, let's see. Well, next Thanks. up, Regina, you're up. It's, uh, we're, this is the Northampton Public Schools. Uh, Regina Nash is here. The superintendent, Councilor Adams, has to be excused. And, and actually, thank you, Councilor Adams, for the time you did put it. That was very impressive. So. I don't believe it's 6.30. You have to leave at 6.30. No one's sticking around for the pizza from the Youth Commission. All right, you make the choices, I understand. Uh, <coughs> Regina, thank you for, first of all, for coming. Thank you for doing Yeoman's work in, as an interim and um, being annealed in the fires of yet another school district. But, uh, and we appreciate your time here. Well, thank you very much. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be here to present this year's budget. I have to tell you that it's quite different from the one presented last year and the most recent years, actually. Um, First of all, we have no layoffs this year. And in fact, we've been um, able to start restoring some of the cuts we had and adding some new positions, which are actually mandates from the state, which I'll get into a little later. Um, I also am very grateful that uh, working with the mayor, um, we've been able to um, basically bring in a budget at 3.4% increase, which I think is unheard of in recent times in Northampton. And I really think you've turned a corner in Northampton with regard to public education and what we're able to do in our school system for our students. And at this point, I'd like to review the additions that we've added to the budget. I'd like to <coughs> talk a little bit about state aid and also talk about school choice, which are usually hot topics at new sorts of meetings. So what I've done, I don't have your budget book, but I have my budget book, and I put your page numbers online. <laughs> so let's see if this helps. Um, if you look at page 105, and hopefully you'll see at the top the <coughs> overview of the current budget. That's it, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good. I did that right. Yeah, no, I'm not a math major. <laughs> but not a math major. Okay. Um, what I'd like to talk about are the additions to the budget. And the first three that you see, I'm halfway down the page, you see two additional tiered support specialists at the elementary, and then the additional 1.0 FTE tiered support specialist from JFK. Um, the legislature has a new law that goes into effect July 1st, and it's chapter uh, 222, which is called the discipline law. And basically what it's telling us is that we're no, able, no longer able to send um, students home for behavioral issues. You know, sometimes when you have little kids and they have a bad day, you can call a mom or dad and they can go home for a little bit. We're no, no longer able to do that. And what we really need to have is some sort of staffing in our schools, um, which we're sort of calling a re-engagement center. Uh, it has to be, by law, a person who's certified teacher, cannot be uh, just an ESP. And um, basically, they are to offer programs and um, courses and classes um, to help students with their academics while they're in the re-engagement center. We're not quite sure how this is going to work. So at this point, we have only two that we're looking for at the elementary level. They will be shared between two of the elementary schools each. So they'll be there two and a half days a week. Um, and they will be doing other things in terms of um, 
looking at developing, implementing, and staffing this re-engagement center. They'll be there to provide academic instruction in the various areas. And they're there to support the students who are having behavioral issues so that hopefully we can get them back into the right track and the improvement uh, so they will not need to remain in the engagement center and will not need to be eventually suspended and or expelled. Mm -hmm. So we're putting those in. Um, we need to do it by law. Uh, I can't say that that's going to work exactly the way we want. And indeed, a year from now, you may be looking at two more so that there is a full-time person in each school. We just can't predict that. We didn't want to go that route because we have so many other needs at this point. We wanted to see how it would play out. With JFK, they have an ESP um, who's sort of fulfilling that uh, um, role now. However, it has to be a certified teacher. So what we've done here in the second line is we put the difference in uh, between the salary of the ESP and the certified teacher. So that's where you see the 21,000. So that, that position will be upgraded and the ESP will actually will be leaving um, of, of the, that person's choice, not ours, mm -hmm. but we'll be able to hire a person. So that's what we're looking for there. These, in my mind, come under that category famously called unfunded mandates, uh, which none of us are happy about, um, but it's there. Um, you also see a half-time position for uh, a SPED teacher at Ryan Road. We have um, a large number of students um, receiving services there, and actually the class size is too large for what we have. So we need to add that other half-time back in. Same thing situation at uh, speech and language teacher at Leeds. We're looking at a 20%, uh, which is another day a week. Um, added to the speech and language teaching position that's already in place. The tech and video instruction is at the high school level. Uh, we now have a .67, so we're looking to add a .33, or basically a third of a position. Um, and we're looking to build upon the JFK experience in technology, which is quite successful in that school, and we just don't have enough uh, to offer at the high school. So the signups have now been completed. Uh, I don't know um, how it actually came out, but that the possible offerings we were looking at was um, photography, introduction to computer science, AV, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, Google Apps, digital literacy, ethics, those sorts of things. So that's adding about a third of the position for the high school and technology in that area. Um, Ryan Road um, was actually, um, when I got here this year, did not have any additional staffing in terms of reading interventionists, um, and that was really a hardship. So we were able to fund, uh, through some grants, a position there, part-time position, but we really need to put in a, a full-time position in at Ryan Road to help with the problems there. Uh, we have some additional supplies, software and licensing. Um, these are things, for instance, at preschool level. We're looking to add tools of mind for all the preschool classes. We piloted that um, this year in terms of uh, one of the kindergarten schools and um, deemed it very successful. We'd like to put it in a preschool. And then in future years, we want to add it to the other kindergartens as well. Um, we also have a new student software program called Aspen and we need to add uh, additional modules for student reporting systems. We have an increase in Comcast internet access, um, health office, web hosting, and software licensing for some of the things we already have, but there are yearly fees for the licenses. Um, and um, we also have an interesting situation with our technology specialists at the elementary level. Currently, we have one between four schools. Um, as you can imagine, it doesn't work very well. Um, so what we're looking to do is double that. We're looking to have two for next year um, so that they will each share two of the elementary schools. This is for direct instruction to students using computers or other devices, and it's also to work with teachers. Um, in my opinion, that need is you need one in each school. But you can only do so much at one time. So we really think that doubling that amount that we have now is um, going to be very helpful. 
And we're also looking at um, increase the attendance and social worker. Uh, that position is currently shared with Smith Boat. Um, we have more than enough need for that position. And in fact, when we looked at this as an administrative team, um, all principals said that is our number one consideration because we have so many families and students in crisis that we really need that position full time in our school district. So um, that's a, an additional 40 percent, which is 60 percent for us now, 40 percent for Smithville. Should be ours full time. And um, she does a fantastic job. So we're happy to add that. So if you look at those additions, we come up with uh, $856,000 um, with um, the addition of the um, level funded services. So our level funded services were 528,000, the additions of 327,000. So our budget increase is $856,000 for FY15. Um, breaking that into percentages, it's 2.2% for the level services, and then another 1.2% um, for the new items that I, I just talked about to make the 3.4% increase. Our total budget is 30.6 million, uh, and the local appropriation is 26.3 million. The rest of that coming out of grants and other resources. If you would like to um, turn the page over to um, 107 in your book. You can see that we've broken out two of our bigger fund sources, one being the school choice revolving account, and what we're looking to do with that, because that plays a big part in your budget. Basically, school choice is about 6% of your budget. Um, you can see where we started with the beginning balance. And by the way, what you do is very smart here. You spend um, the money you received last year in your, next, in your current year in the following year's budget. So you always know how much you have when you start, and that's very important. So your beginning balance in July of this year, um, 2013, was um, 1.8 million. Um, we're projecting this year you're going to receive another 1.3 million. Um, and we're looking at expenses out of that of 1.2 million uh, and projected balance of 1.9 and then what we're using this year in the budget 1.6. So next um, June 30th uh, of 15, we should have about 327,000 left. And it's important that you have something left over because you don't know what your emergencies are going to be. You don't want to cut it too close and actually you can have uh, by law up to 5% of your budget um, reserved. So this is well within that. Uh, circuit breaker, which we see receive for special education cost. And in fact, um, these funds can only be spent on special education cost. Usually there quite a few are spent with regard to other district placements uh, and teacher salaries. Um, as you look through these cost figures, and again, this is different in that we are spending um, in the same year um, that you're receiving the funds. And at the end of uh, next June 15, we should have about 220000 That's not a lot of money because some of our students um, can cost as much as $100,000. So if you get a new one in, it's unexpected, and they need those funds for that sort of purpose. So I think these are very reasonable figures to have. If you look at your page 108, this gives you a breakdown of your grants uh, and your other funds um, that are used in your budget. And you can see your budgets across the top going from FY13, 14, and then into 15, uh, which is your projected budget. And you can see that our grants have increased um, over last year. We're, we're getting about 1.4 million in, which is a, a tremendous help for the school district. Um, the pages starting on 109 is how we use those grants and the revolving funds. Uh, for instance, we have revolving funds for um, building usage, we have revolving funds for uh, food services, etc. So you can see how we use those funds. We use them across schools, we use them across districts, um, and those are offsets to your budget. Page 111, um, your chapter 70 appropriation. 
And um, what I'd like to point out there, although it's not a lot different from um, other school districts, is that um, your school choice, your um, chapter 70 appropriations are not keeping up with the budget numbers. Um, in other words, and if you look at FY05, um, your uh, chapter 70 was 32.4%. Was and if you go all the way up now to FY15, you can see that it's only 26.91% of your budget. Um, I guess the good news is, uh, as long as I've been um, in this area, which is now about 13 years, we've been telling um, the legislature that they really need to look again at the funding formula. Uh, a lot of things are not included in it. Ed reform was back in, I believe, 1992. Um, for instance, in the funding formula, we do not have school nurses, we don't have all the technology that we require now, et cetera. So uh, the legislature, I believe, has agreed that they have now will establish a committee to look at the funding formula. I think it's very important that you stay on top of that and that you really uh, engage your local legislators in terms of looking at that and being cognizant of the fact that we really need to get some more state funding for our budget. Uh, towns and cities just can't can't continue to do it the way they, they have been. And um, just sort of a fun chart, in 113, you will see um, the FY15 budget funding sources. And you will see that school choice is 6% uh, of your funding source. Um, you can see the other grants that are listed there, et cetera, and you can see your appropriation is 86%. That's a lot of them. Um, I'd like to look a little bit at um, School Choice, page 115. And a question I answer every year, actually I answer at least four times every year. Um, and that is that we do not hire additional teachers to take care of school choice youngsters. What I've always used the term is backfill. Right. We have places within our classrooms where we can hold another one or two students and we receive money for that purpose. And that is a godsend to districts that are getting school choice youngsters in. Uh, when you're losing them, it's a different story. And I've always felt very fortunate. I've always been associated with the school district that we've gotten them in. Um, you do quite well with that. And um, first of all, the enrollment is on 115. And if you see, you're sort of leveling off with enrollment. A lot of the districts in, in uh, Western Mass are losing students, considerable numbers of students. Um, if you look from about 2008 down, you'll see that you're pretty much around that 2,700 student mark, and that's a good thing. You're not increasing, but you're not losing. Um, so that's helpful. And if you look in terms of um, page 116, you can see that um, where you have the incoming school choice pupils and um, the outgoing as well. So for instance, an average over the 10-year period um, you have brought in uh, 1,255,000 per year of school choice money. And you are losing, because of students who are going out, 415,000. So the numbers are still in your favor. Why do kids choice out? Lots of reasons. There's lots of choices now. Sometimes it's as simple as a family uh, working schedule. Uh, they work in another district, it's easier to transport their kid, they want their child next to you where they're working, etc. It can be that easy. It can be a matter of families moving. Um, it can be a matter of, of the fact that there are a lot of um, choices in terms of charter. Um, some of them are very specialized. Mm -hmm. And it can be a choice in terms of you have a lot of private schools in this area. So those are some reasons, but the very factor that you, you're you know, losing um, with kids going out 415,000, but at least you're gaining 1.255 uh, a million a year. So that's helpful, and you're sort of maintaining that. Mm -hmm. Murphy, you yeah. have a question? Yeah, yeah, just I noticed there was a, a pretty decent, you know, couple hundred thousand dollar increase in the coming year for, for incoming tuition. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a, we know we're expecting 
We're expecting the school committee has approved. Uh, let me make sure I'm right on the number. I believe the number is 79 um, openings, K through 12, in our school system. And at this point, we have filled 64 of those. Um, so we still have some openings. Mm -hmm. And these are across all grade levels, and they are across um, at the high school and middle school, all subject areas. So even though it's 79 students we're looking to have come in on top of the choice we already have, um, it doesn't mean that they're all in one class, except no, they're, they're all they're spread they're out. Yeah. And where are they generally coming from? They're coming from Holyoke, and they're coming from East Hampton. Still from East Hampton? Because mm -hmm. East Hampton's made great strides in it has, improving the new their high school. We're still getting their, still getting their yeah. kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the big ones, and then there's lots of little ones that, you know. Mm -hmm. And where, where do our kids go? Where do they tend to go to? Um, it's interesting because you lose a lot at the elementary level. I believe it was 100, and don't hold me to this, but I think we lose about 155 students at the elementary level, and most of them go to Smith Campus School. That's the number one loss. Mm -hmm. They know, come back for high school. I know we do a lot of incoming for high school, but for a while we had a lot that were leaving to skip middle school and then coming back. That has that trend changed? I can't tell you. I can't tell I don't you know if, it's, if it's changed. Because I know they've tried very hard to yeah. combat that at the middle school. But I do know they, they come back um, for the certainly high for the high school. And um, that's one of the, the concerns that, that I have and the administrative team has that I think we really need um, more resources at the elementary level. And I think also if we looked in terms of looking more deeply into before school and after school programs that might be associated with the school district, we might be able to keep some of those kids here at the elementary. But I think the reality is also the fact it's hard to get over the cachet that my child is at Smith Campus School. Uh, Smith College is it's a big draw, it's a big mm -hmm. name, and I think a lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. Now, remind us as to following the money, I mean, if, is that a private school? Do they in fact take tuition or do they just go? It's a private school. Mm -hmm. So they don't, take, they don't take sending tuition with them? We lose it, we don't get it. Right. So for we every student it, that goes there, we lose $5,000 approximately. Okay. If they need special services, we will lose even more money. So we don't get the money mm -hmm. because they're not our students. Mm -hmm. But it's not equivalent to a charter school. It's not equivalent yeah, to a charter. It is not. Yeah. It's okay. private, Charters, it's private. They, they really are expensive. Yes. And of the of the um, pupils leaving of the 70, at least last year they left, how many were charter and how many were campus school or other private, you know? I don't have that. I'm sorry. I can get you that information. Oh, right. I don't know the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that, um, you know, I have a bias. I'm a public school person. I always have been, and I believe in what we do in public schools. Um, my bias is that we don't have a level playing field when it comes to charter. And the concern that I have is that we're, we're paying out of the school district about three times for a charter child as to what we're getting in for a regular child. I don't think that's a fair situation. So um, as much as we sort of protest that, um, I haven't seen great moves in, in any direction in helping it. But I think we have to keep protesting because it's not a level playing field, it just isn't. Uh, at one point when charter <coughs> schools were first um, coming into being, there were also things such as um, no interest loans um, that the state were putting up right. for buildings and materials. And um, we don't get that. No. So those are the issues that I'm going to talk about. And to add to that, the behavioral mandate that you described yes. is not, is not and in fact, actually behavioral challenges in charter schools are referred back into municipal schools. And I, I <coughs> you know, based on my experience at least, um, I've seen um, children with special needs um, go off to charter schools and they're, they're often not there long and they're sent back to public right. schools because they, they really are not able to take care of those needs. Um, I also don't see very many uh, students with second language going to um, charter schools. Well, there's also no transportation. Yes. <coughs> Another feature. I, and if I can interrupt your narrative along that line, um, uh, obviously it, it would be appropriate to ask you about the late start 
funding priority. Mm -hmm. I, I, Mr. Harrell is yes, here. Yes, I saw him come in, and I was <laughs> sure that that issue would come yeah, up. Yeah, well, I suspect, and it, well, and Steve, you'll have an opportunity to speak tomorrow night at the council meeting if you if you so desire. This is a, that will be a public hearing where okay. the public can talk. Uh, I just in this, to in this. I'm sorry. I just wanted to listen. Okay, to good, good. Now. That's that's what we're here for. That's why we call it a hearing. And <laughs> so, Regina, if you could just talk about, uh, I, I know there's an enormous, complicated narrative that goes with this, but the decision, uh, if you could just describe or expand on the decision this year. The decision on Late Start, in my mind, is actually an economic consideration. There are approximately now 200 schools across the country who have gone to Late Start. There's also some who already had Late Start. There's about 200 who have gone. Um, the research says, because it's a rhythm of teenage kids, that um, their sleep pattern is different from adults. And there's also some research, although it's not conclusive, um, that says if you provide a later start for your um, adolescence, um, then there's an increase in um, their performance level. So all things being wonderfully equal, and money wasn't a consideration, then I think it'd be great to have late start. But that's not the case. So. I will tell you where I stand, where the administrative team stands. To do this year's proposal and to provide enough transportation to do late start, which would also affect the timing of the elementary schools and the middle school, not just the high school, was an additional $68,000. We don't have an additional $68,000. And because I was sure that someone would say, what are your other educational needs? I brought a list. Late start's not here. and be down here. There may indeed be a few students who have medical issues with the early start at the high school level. If that's the case and there's medical documentation, we have a vehicle to work with that. And we'd be happy to work with those few parents. I think for most students that whether they're starting a half an hour later or not is not going to affect their academic achievement. That's my opinion. I've been in education 47 years, the last 21 as superintendent. I think that someone said to me, why didn't you try to do late start at Frontier Regional? Because we that was, a, it's a separate system there. I've got four elementaries and one high school. And um, I could easily have done that. But I would be considered out of my mind to even propose that. Because that's a different way of living. It's a rural area. People get up early. Kids get up early. We all got up early. And did some of us suffer from not having slept in the morning? Probably. But somehow we all made it, and some of us became very good students as, in spite of it. I think the other thing that's new in now, nowadays is the whole issue of technology. And we have a lot of studies that say um, kids going to sleep with their phone under their pillow, uh, being on the computer just before bedtime, uh, interrupts their sleep habits. So I don't know that if we do late start, that we're going to change any of that. And therefore, I'm not sure that that's worth the $68,000. In fact, I don't think it is worth the $68,000. So I'm not a proponent of Late Start. The administrative team is not in favor of Late Start. And if indeed the school committee will make that decision to do it, then that's up to the school committee. They have ultimate decision making but it will not be with the recommendation of the administrative team. You have, um, in, in the district, we have, we have schools that excel and some schools that do not, some, mm -hmm. some schools that are mm -hmm. um, underperforming. 
-hmm. And is it your intent to rechannel that sixty-eight thousand? That let's call it the mythical sixty-eight thousand, but that appropriate those funds to boost um, opportunities and programs at, at those underserved schools. Yeah, I, I have a whole list here of of educational needs for students that I think outweigh the cost of buses. And just quickly, because I know you're interested, and I do want to get out there because you're going to see these things again next year and the year after, because you can't do them all at once. Under elementary, we don't have reading recovery teachers anymore in our schools. Reading recovery is an expensive program, but it pays off, and there's a lot of research to support that. They work with very few kids, and they work with them at the first, second, and sometimes the third grade level, usually first and second. They give them the basis, they check in on them later, and then these are kids that do not need special ed services when they're on, or at least not as many. We don't have written recovery kids, the teachers in our elementary. We only have two technology specialists as of this budget. We really need one in each school. There's no librarians in your elementary schools. So you need something called a media center specialist who can do the library part and do the technology part. And you need them to be in one school at a time. So they can schedule in classes of students and everyone gets the benefit of both the literary and the technology part. They also need to be helping teachers with the technology. You need one in each school, you don't have it. You don't have anything close to having any sort of foreign language offered at the elementary level. We know that's when kids learn best, a second language. If you talk with principals, they would tell you you don't have enough art and music in your elementary schools. Math coaches, unheard of. We need desperately another half-time psychologist because we're getting more and more student needs. Families are in crisis, their kids are in crisis. I've got in one elementary school, three kids. Now remember, we're, we're K through five. I've got three kids in one elementary school who are currently hospitalized for mental health issues. We need another special education teacher at the elementary level because our numbers, we're running about 26% of special ed needs as a percentage of our student body. Middle school, we have what was the Life Skills Program, it's called Goals. These are for cognitively impaired youngsters. I need at least another .6 of a teacher because I've got too many kids with one teacher right now in an eight. Math and literacy coaches, we don't have them at the middle school. And that's where I also need another .5 psychologist for the same sorts of reasons. High school, foreign language. I've got some classes of foreign language that, that last year in Latin we had 36 kids in one class, beginning Latin. Um, we also have situations where our higher level French, I only have one French teacher. So, you know, if we're looking at French three, four, or five, I have times in which students have done one, two, and three, and they have to wait a year and a half before they can do four and five in between times because we can't offer it every year. Physical education. We just did a pre-assessment in terms of civil rights compliance. We don't meet the standards for physical education at the high school because the mandate is that you have physical education every year. We don't have that. Special education. I've got 26 kids to one for special education services at the high school. It's the highest numbers we've got in the district or in the high school. District-wide, technology devices. We've done a wonderful job in Northampton of the um, capital planning. I believe you had a five-year plan. This is the last year we're looking to fund $100,000 for technology. Infrastructure, it's absolutely wonderful. And I commend all of you for it. But we don't have devices for kids to use. I mean, you have to do the infrastructure first. There's no doubt about that. But for instance, uh, I'm going to be recommending next week to the school committee that we use, that we go with MCAS testing one more year uh, and not park. 
The reason for that is, well, there's several reasons, one of which is we don't have enough devices for the kids who need to take the testing to do it all at once within the timeline that we have. Mm -hmm. And there are some other reasons as well, which I'll go into with the school committee. Um, and I think one of the big things you're missing in, is the secondary director of curriculum and assessment. We were fortunate to be able to hire a person this year. Um, it's supposed to do K through 12, but in all honesty, she's trying to coordinate and work through the elementary and part of the middle school. Um, I don't have anyone who's trying to coordinate and work with the high school level as much as I'm trying to pull in the assistant principal, which isn't fair to the high school. You, you just can't, I mean, in the central office right now, you've got a superintendent, a business manager, and one curriculum person. That's it. The state keeps putting mandates out. We've got 12 new mandates. Teacher evaluation system. Now they want us to do um, surveys next year. Mandated surveys. Kids are going to do surveys on teachers, as young as kindergarten, by the way. And teachers are going to do surveys on principals and other central office people. So what I found out today, because I missed this somehow, um, the state is working with a company to do surveys. There's one survey that's 20 questions. There's another survey that's 45 questions. It could take up to a whole period for a kid to do it. And they're supposed to do it at the high school level and all their teachers. To coordinate and calibrate all that information, school districts, if they use these tests, have to pay for it. I missed that point. I found that out. So, you know, the mandates keep coming, and, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, when we get back to the issue of where does late start fall, it's not a priority in my book because you have too many other things that affect too many youngsters where the need is there. And I honestly do not believe that late start is going to make that difference for the number of students we think it will. And if indeed there's a medical issue and there's a problem, and I'm not denying there might be, we are equipped to work with that family, with the doctor involved, and do something to adjust that child's schedule. And we're happy to do it. And, and there are two other questions here, from, uh, but one quick follow-up. The the high school, where does it rank in the, in the, in the pantheon of the state, for instance, as, as for levels of achievement and performance? It's level one. The high school is a level one. So we have a high-functioning high school. Yes, very much so. But uh, since I'm here and since you're asking, <laughs> um, you have an interesting high school. You have wonderful AP courses, and you have a number of them, and I think they belong there. But we have a very unique and very diversified student body. We do not have all AP type students. And what I think is missing is some of the things that we need to have in place for those students who are second uh, English language learners, um, who have specific needs in terms of either mental health or uh, in terms of special needs. Um, we need more help in those areas. And we can't have everything geared to one sort of student. And I think that this is a wonderful community. I really love it. I <coughs> fall in love with, with what you have offered here. I think you, you've got a basic, wonderful community and school system, and I really enjoyed working with the people this year. But I think you have to broaden your perspective in terms of the types of people we have in our schools, the types of families who live in this community. They don't all live in one area. And I, I think that we're shortchanging some of these some of these groups. And I, I, I think you need to work in that direction. I appreciate your commentary on that. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell and then Councilor Shera and then Councilor LaGarge. And let me uh, I know. point out that we're going to have a number of those students queuing up outside in a little bit but and we have the fire department to come too so the but uh, sorry. no 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 please don't apologize this is this is actually critical so and this is the most significant portion of the budget that we approve so it's it's appropriate that we give it all due attention Councilor I just wanted a hall pass you know I just wanted to, <laughs> um, no my, my question is very straightforward um, how much is the, the bus pass that families pay to use the bus 
you know, probably you know? a couple hundred dollars. Uh, it's like 300 and then there's a reduction based on the number of kids you have in your household. I get a second child discount because I have two kids. Okay. Is there any... Is there any um, waiver of that? Uh, yes, if you're yes. on free and reduced. You're free and reduced. Yeah, they're, yeah. I guess my only my only concern is, and I don't know that it is a concern, but it's just a question: um, Is there a kind of a donut hole between people who get a, families who get a waiver and those who have to pay this money? Um, have you heard any uh, that it's a hardship in any way? Because there hasn't always been a bus fee, is my understanding. Yeah. And it kind of builds off the way you ended your your previous comments about how we um, you know we do live in a we, we like to think we live in a diverse, you know, uh, district, and we want to make sure that everyone is served and can get to get to school and, and learn. So. And, and I guess what I would say is, I certainly would hope that you never do away with high school busing, because there will be kids who will not be able to get to school. Well, no, in fact, I'm, my concern is the opposite. I, I'm, my question is if it's too restrictive. If um, if the, the bus fee is I think that restrictive, I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, um, I just want to make sure it is available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. Um, there is um, a, re there is a free and reduced students have to still, their parents still have to apply to have them ride on the bus, but there is no fee for that. However, everyone gets charged a late fee if they miss the deadlines. And I believe there are three times a year that you can access the bus. Yes, I'm seeing shaking the heads. Um, so I, I think the, the issue is that um, the free and reduced people do indeed have access to the bus transportation. Um, I don't know how it works with um, families that are um, sort, of, right. sort of a little bit above. Okay. I, but I'm you guessing. haven't heard that. So. But I have not heard that. Okay. So I think it's working. And, okay. um, right. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Sheriff. Um, particularly your, the list of, of things that are needed at the elementary level, do, could you speculate if, if some of those things were, particularly like arts and things like that, were added back in, might that help with the kids that are choicing out at that elementary level? I'd like to think so, and I would say that based on my experience. I had an elementary school where we lost art and music for one year. We also lost a number of students. There was private funds put back in for those things, and when we restarted, we started getting school choice kids back in, but we didn't get back the residents who stayed where they had choice down. Mm -hmm. So I would, I do think that there's a correlation, and I think that parents are, are very um, much interested in having the arts as part of their regular elementary school program, mm -hmm. as it should be. And I think that it might be helpful. I can't guarantee it, but I think it would be. Council of Yes. Um, when will school committee be bringing this up on the late start? What they voted, what the school committee voted is that February of next year, after they have had, uh, starting in September through February or thereabouts, um, daily counts as to who's receiving a bus pass and who actually rides on a daily basis. Um, they will again look at this issue because they want to see, as I understand it, the thought is that if few enough kids ride the bus, then they might be able to do away with the bus. I think that's unlikely in my perspective and my experience because the distance involved when you do away with one bus, you're gonna have kids on the bus much longer. Um, I, I think that you have to really look at a lot of factors in that. The one thing that I feel I failed this year is I wanted an ultimate decision on yes or no. And I would say that that's what the school board has to do next year. They have to make a decision, because this is five years in the making, it takes a lot of time and energy, a lot of uncertainty, and you just have to make that decision. If you're going to put the money toward it, then do it. If not, vote, you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. But it'll be up, up for the next budget approximately February when we start doing budgets. Right. And I also agree with you on the arts and music. I think there is a tremendous amount of value on that. I was also surprised to see you don't have an orchestra program in your schools. Uh, that made a big difference in our schools. When we put that in, we grew it over the 12 years. Mm -hmm. It really made a big difference. Superintendent Nash, thank you again. I appreciate your candor. Mm -hmm. and, and um, and also very grateful for the time you devoted to our school system. Thank you. Thank I've you. enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed working with so many people here. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to. Thank you. Thank you.
Next up, FD, and um, I'm going to alert the folks out in the hallway clamoring with pizza. Ah, you good, there you go. Uh, and and as usual, I'm going to ask uh, Assistant Chief Nichols and Deputy Chief Norris to, to join me. Thank Sorry about putting you on the on the hurry up. <laughs> but right. it's a, um, let me ask you as a question: Is there a time constraint that you'd like a more abbreviated presentation? Yeah, I think if we could, okay. um, each yeah, the next meeting was scheduled for in, in about four minutes. You don't okay. have to do a four minute right. presentation. Well, They've been alerted that it will be uh, <laughs> it will be running a little late. So. What I was going to do is sort of give you an update on fiscal fourteen and, and some of the changes there as the EMS system matured. But I think I'm going to focus more just on fiscal fifteen and sort of how the department has changed over the years to evolve into really a fire rescue department. If you remember years ago, there were a number of things. First of all, the fire department didn't do emergency medical services. There were far more structure fires. Uh, it was common to see me coming before council for a half a million dollar transfer and overtime based on either a number of injuries or absences. Uh, and we've made great stride in all of those. Uh, most notably is really taking the EMS system, growing it, and then transitioning to a true fire rescue department in this coming fiscal year. Uh, so first I'm going to ask Deputy Chief Norris just to give you sort of a sense of the EMS program as we go into next year and then uh, ask uh, Assistant Chief Nichols just to give you a quick overview of uh, fire and operations. So good evening. Um, so right now the fire department currently has five ambulances. They're all licensed at the paramedic level. It's the highest level pre-hospital in the state of Massachusetts. Um, Along with that, we have two engine companies that are also licensed as paramedic first response engines. That actually, that program was implemented last April, so we're coming upon the uh, first fiscal year conclusion in terms of the operation of that program, and we'll get a chance to evaluate that both operationally and also fiscally how that's working. Um, so far, um, just uh, looking at it from the outside, it, it's going well. We always had the staff on there that had the training to do it. We just never had the ability to get them the equipment and supplies to do the job they're trying to do. Um, so it has made, in my opinion, a significant uh, improvement in terms of patient care out there in the community. Um, we're doing about 6,000 transports a year. Um, most of them go to CDH, and then the other ones typically went on the base states, the trauma center, or the pediatric calls. How many a year? We're up around 6,000. 6, um, and then uh, we're still doing mutual aid to some of the surrounding communities just as they bring in mutual aid to us. And we also, because of the hospitals here in our community, we do get a lot of requests for the ALS intercepts. Um, an intercept, an ALS intercept, is when they have an ambulance on scene, but they don't have the uh, level required, a paramedic level, to do the job uh, based on the state protocols, so they have to call us. Um, and we get that call because they're coming to Northampton to the hospital. That's a quick snapshot of the system. What do you, what do you see the trend? How, how is it, is it, are, are there numbers to track and trend how that's that going to expand? The, the, the trend is going up a little bit based on the age of the community and surrounding communities. Right. So. I'm sorry, Dwayne. Go ahead. Well, right. <laughs> no problem. Uh, operationally, the, the department, as, we, as the chief mentioned, we're transitioning to the fire rescue service out through there. I think over the years we've really done a good job of integrating both of those. Uh, we really maintain two engine companies as a minimum throughout the city and use the people at the ambulances, if available, to cross staff other pieces, the rescue, the ladder, things like that. So it really, it's a big value, I think, in that our people are cross trained uh, with the EMS certification and then certainly having the firefighter skills uh, to be able to benefit the community that way. Uh, operationally in the department, uh, I think we've done a good job to try to manage uh, injured on duty status. Uh, we, we maintain that all the time. 
uh, throughout the year. I know I have two retirements coming up this year. One's uh, not job related, uh, the other one is job related, but that's probably the only injured on duty basic disability that we've had in, in a number of years out there. Uh, and we've really managed our people, uh, I think with the uh, lifts that we have in the ambulance, the power lift systems that lift the stretchers up. We do training continually with how to lift proper, you know, proper lifting procedures and things like that uh, to try to maintain that. Uh, we also maintain fire prevention out there. Uh, as we know, fires are down nationally, but we still need to maintain that service uh, out there because uh, we still, I think the chief mentioned, uh, we still have how much of a dollar loss last but year? Just approaching three million dollars in fire dollar loss. So, so it's you know we're we're having fires, but they seem to be a little bit more significant. But you know nationally, uh, fires are down, but we still need to just keep in the back of our mind that we still need to keep the staffing levels up there. So you know operation, like say you know with the suppression forces, EMS people, fire prevention, um, just trying to keep everything running and and uh, as status quo as we can. And I'd just like to mention that, that Deputy Chief Norris did a phenomenal job helping me uh, wrestle with the Excel spreadsheets and prepare the budget. Uh, and Assistant Chief Nichols does a great job managing the schedule so we maximize sort of the shift float we have, the people above the minimum, to reduce overtime. Uh, and we've had a, a constant trend. So, so fiscal 15, the budget is about $5.5 million. And a reasonable question would be, what do you get for that? What's the level of service? Uh, as Dwayne said, uh, 24 hours a day, we have two engine companies, a shift commander, and between two and three ambulances staffed. Uh, in, in sort of last year's dramatic uh, labor management settlement, we're now actually working together and looking at some scheduling options to have a third ambulance and more cross-staffing of equipment. But some perspectives, before the fire department took over EMS, we had 10 people on duty. We now have approximately three more, but we're running between, well, if I have five ambulances, we're running three. So that represents sort of that shift from the fire orientation to more that rescue orientation. And every fire we've had, we've had ambulances available in, and been able to meet national standards, and that includes the arson fires we had with the multiple events occurring. The ambulances were on calls, freed up, and so it complements what we're able to do rather than detracts from that. <clears throat> so in terms of beyond that, there are also about 60 services that the fire department offers, ranging from CPR education, which Chris is leading an initiative uh, in partnership this coming year, to uh, installation of car seats and fire extinguisher training, those hidden things uh, when we go out and put someone's smoke detector in that are sort of unseen that the department does a great job in. Um, as we look at the budget itself, there's uh, one thing that's counterintuitive. One, uh, overall there's a change of 0.05 in a part-time position that's going up, but there are four salaries being reduced, and that's because of the closure of the federal SAFER grant uh, Deputy yeah. Chief Norris had applied for that several years ago. It's a four-year grant. The, the grant ended this year. Those four positions are taken out of the budget. Uh, <clears throat> however, with those four positions out, the budget still increases fairly dramatically, and that's a reflection on the contractual settlement and the labor costs as we go down the road, as well as an adjustment sort of for trend, looking at some EMS supplies, and we've also incorporated the police department's semi-automatic defibrillator program into our budget for management as well. Uh, so those are some of the, the quick things. Um, as we go forward, one of the things Dwayne said, there's a reduction in fires. I never thought I'd sit before a finance committee and say there's a reduction in fires, but it really is true nationwide. We still have to be ready, we have to be vigilant, we have to have the resources, but we'll refocus those resources to the advantage of the community. That means our people experience less fire but have to be ready. So we're putting more effort into training and specifically live fire training as we go forward. Um, the staffing configuration, uh, again, we're working with our local and with the mayor to look at some options, but will remain, remain relatively the same, providing the same level of service. With those four positions gone, that decreases the number of extra people we have and will put more pressure on overtime. However, this is the second year that we've actually been able to turn money back uh, in the budget. Um, so we're going to have to manage that. Dwayne's going to have to double down with me on that. Uh, but we're fairly positive that we're actually going to be fine with that as we go forward. Um, and let's see. 
Uh, during the year, we anticipate seven openings uh, based on people leaving. I heard one, one of our people was going to go into the Navy last week, so it seems every time we, we get some people on board, we have some more openings. Similar to the police department, it's uh, a much more mobile workforce that we're seeing. And some of our other initiatives in this coming year are to harness technology for ambulances and GPS and uh, look at a bigger city system to help out with uh, record keeping, data management, and fire prevention. Um, so, so that gives you sort of the quick thumbnail, probably longer than you wanted and more than you ever wanted to know. But for $5.5 million, that's what you get. <laughs> uh, Council Murphy, then Council LeBar. Mm -hmm. Oh, just, I was going to ask about the four positions, but it sounds like with seven leaving, attrition is going to take care of it. Right. So, no, if there's chairs for everybody still, nobody yep. gets cut off. So, so we're actually in a hiring process right now, and even considering those um, four being gone, we sort of phase them out already there are a number of positions open. Mm -hmm. And when we look into the crystal ball, uh, Deputy Chief Manas is predicting seven. We were predicting five, but sometimes he's right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I know, even though we theoretically had, we were fully staffed last year, and we tried really hard to do that, we're still looking at $400,000 in overtime. So if we start now losing bodies, right. and have what, what contributes to the overtime staying there? Because that was one of the big incentives to us to staff up was to reduce our overtime expense and have people. But even when we have people, we have overtime. What, what attributes to that? Sort of the catch-22 of you can have people, you can have overtime, and which is more expensive. <laughs> We've tried to look at sort of the level of shift float we have to minimize overtime. Comparative to other communities, we actually compare really well for the amount of overtime. For example, if you look at Andover, they have a million dollar overtime budget. Norwood and Marlboro are now struggling uh, and the one thing you hear from fire departments our size is the management of overtime. Uh, I even read an article uh, that came from Hawaii on the management of overtime. So it is a very common thing in the fire service, but it's really pulling that together. Yeah. I went on vacation and the headline in the Hawaiian newspaper was fire department battling the city over overtime. So it's like... A coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, Councilor Murphy, did, uh, when we have an opening, that salary sits there unused. That will then go to contribute to overtime to pay that difference. The further we go, the more overtime you're gonna have and that's gonna become a problem. So we gotta keep that in check and that's gonna be our challenge during the next year. So basically, the overtime comes from having to maintain a mandatory shift strength. So you've gotta backfill people and without the people to backfill with, Right. Yeah, which is why we were trying to keep you fully staffed so that there'd be more right. people to pull. And it's not even so much a mandatory shift strength, it's the capability to staff two engines, a ship commander, and three ambulances. And I think that's what really resonates with the residents of the community is that level of service. Mm. Well, I mean, and unlike the police, you have one guy to a car, that's the team that functions. Right. You need multiple bodies to make an engine work. Yeah. So, so the engine is a useful one, but there's only two guys on it. Right. So, so some departments, some of your volunteer departments, they show up on scene with a driver. Well, that's great, and there's a fire truck, and it has shiny red lights, but it's not going to do much until other people get there. So we staff ambulances with two people. We, as Assistant Chief Nichols said, complement that to reduce injuries with some other responses, and three people on engine companies is typically what we do. Council of Arts. I want to thank you, Chief the department for all the hard work that you do. It is very difficult, I think, between the police department and the fire department of controlling the overtime. You cannot tell when you're gonna have a fireman or firewoman getting hurt or a police officer, a man or woman, getting hurt. You do not know if there's gonna be a medical problem. So I think that you can really see that there's a change going on in this department because I know, I know how much money for years and years that you had difficulties with. I want to thank your department for everything that you're doing and also having that great bridge between the city and especially the Cooley Dixon Hospital with Dr. Conway and them. I think that that is so valuable. Thank you. Council Chair. Um, I also want to thank you for doing a great job and congratulations on this completing this trans this transition period where you're now fully integrated the um, the rescue and fire and um, congratulations on the grant that you just got last week um, and uh, are there other are, since you're losing these four positions because that grant has is 
coming to an end. Are there more on the horizon that you're that you're going for and hope to get to? Well, the programs are still in place. Mm -hmm. um, they, they've changed somewhat in that they don't, for the staffing ones, they don't require a community um, sort of year to mm -hmm. pay. So, so typically it would be the federal government pays for so much and either percentages it down or the community pays one year. Now it's just they sort of give out the money. Uh, but we really need to look at how does that help us meet some national standards. Mm -hmm. We've come further by adding EMS and meeting national standards than we did by adding sort of the safer grant. Every year the, the grant period is open for both the Federal Fire Act, which is sort of your safety equipment and apparatus and things, and the safer grant. Uh, we have a discussion with the mayor on what's sort of reasonable to pursue in the next year, and that's how that sprinkler grant was pushed through. The problem with the saving grants is you get the money, you hire the people, but then the grant rents out, mm -hmm. and then you're staring at a hole mm -hmm. of X thousand dollars that you have to fill. Right. And we're looking at the attrition lined up nicely. So, yeah. And, 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 and my career, which is getting all too long, uh, I've never had to lay anyone off, and it's the attrition that's enabled us to do that, because if we were fully staffed with no attrition, we would have to look at layoffs. Any other questions? Gentlemen, well done. You'd be good auctioneers. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Schedule the last slot every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>